Um, so hi, everybody. Thanks for coming to um, our panel today. And it's called The New Frontiers in AI for Urban Space, Big Data and Parallel Computing. Uh, we have five, five speakers today for the first hour of our session, um, and including me. And that will be the first to go will be Tom Osberger, who is now a software engineer at Microsoft, where he's working on the Plan 3 computer. He's, he's worked on um, open source libraries like Pandas, Dusk, and has been involved in the Pangeo community. Um, second, we have James Bettner, who is now the Director of Technical Services at Anaconda. Um, Jim was a lecturer and researcher in computational neuroscience at the University of Edinburgh in, in Scotland for 10 years, and now works in open source tooling for science, and especially the holovis.org and the pyvis.org, which one of which will be demonstrated today. Um, third, we have Ryan McGranigan, who is now the Principal Data Scientist and Aerospace Engineering Scientist at Astra Associates, uh, where he leads the data science and machine learning efforts to improve our understanding of the Earth's space environment. Um, and then we have our Chair of the Machine Learning Research Cluster, Jensen Sun, who is a Research Assistant Professor in the Center for Spatial Information Science and Systems at George Mason University. Um, he's also a practitioner of AI and high performance computing in geoscience. And I'm the community fellow for the East Admission Learning Research Cluster. My name is Cindy Lin, um, and I'm currently a postdoctoral fellow at the Atkinson Center for Sustainability and the Department of Information Science. Oh, so with that introduction, I'll let Tom take it away first. Um, just a reminder to audience members, if you will have any questions for us, please um, place them in on Slido. Um, and yeah. Go, go, go ahead, Tom. All righty, let me get this view up. Uh, hopefully y'all can see my screen now. So yeah, I'll be uh, pretty brief. Uh, gonna do a quick little intro to what we're, what we're doing at Microsoft uh, with this thing we're calling the planetary computer. Uh, so that's a, a pretty nice, uh, neat name for what we're working on. The basic idea is we wanna support sustainability decision-making. Um, we have all these really rich data sets uh, for sustainability, for you know, all sorts of things, geospatial data, biodiversity data, all sorts of things, but they can be quite difficult to use in practice. And so that's what our, our team's responsibility is, is to uh, make it possible to use this data uh, for decision making without necessarily having to have a PhD in both remote sensing and distributed computing. Um, in terms of the actual components of the planetary computer, uh, so we have a, a data catalog. So this is like the you know uh, table stakes. We have a, a whole bunch of data in in blob storage on Azure, um, and then a, a nice catalog for browsing that data and for for finding you know what's available. Um, and then beyond that, to actually make the data useful, we have various APIs, uh, mostly based around Stack to uh, enable our users to search and query and find the exact bits of that data that they actually care about. Um, and then for our users uh, who are you know, wanting an easy way to compute on that data um, and you know, like a nice cloud native way, close, you know, compute close to the data, we have a, a Jupyter Hub set up for them and we have guides for how to set up your own Jupyter Hubs if you want to compute on the data from Azure. Uh, and for our users who need to scale their workflows out to really large computations, um, we're, we're using Dask and Dask Gateway to uh, enable our users to do scalable compute on that data. And these are all in service of building you know, actual applications that decision makers can use to uh, you know, address their sustainability concerns. Um, I want to take a just a brief moment. So I'm kind of just setting up for the workshop uh, session right now. So I'll do a brief intro to Stack in my remaining time. So whenever you have a problem, it's typically going to you know be phrased as some sort of you know I want on at least for geospatial data you know you're going to want some data set covering some region over some time period. Um, you know, con concretely, we have, you know, a desire for Landsat 8 collection to level two covering this bounding box over this date range. Um, if all you have is files on blob storage, um, you know, that's, it's not nothing, but it is still a bit difficult to go from this gigantic list of files that comprise uh, Landsat 8 collection to level two on Azure to an actual, you know, I want this exact you know, subset of the data. 
uh, because it's for my region of interest and for my time of interest. So these, this big list of URLs is a bit difficult to work with. Um, so that's where, where Stack comes in. So Stack's this emerging uh, standard for cataloging geospatial data. Um, and it's also an, an API for working with that data. So we have a Stack API hosted here. And to answer our query from earlier, it'd be a matter of saying, I want this data, Landsat 8, collection 2, level 2, over this bounding box, over this date range. And then you quickly are able to get back just the subset of the data that you care about. Um, OK, so like, that's actually it for, for uh, this. This is sufficiently set us up for the workshop, which will be later on, about halfway through the, the session today. Um, just a quick preview of what we'll be going over. Um, I'm setting up hubs for everyone to log into, um, and then we'll we'll get a we'll we'll see how to use the Stack API to query uh, some geospatial data. We'll be trying to predict some uh, crop types based on Sentinel-2 imagery, uh, and we'll train a few different models to to do that. All righty, thanks everyone. Excellent, thanks Tom. I think we have some time for questions if anyone have, have any at the moment. Um, but if there's nothing on Slido, I will uh, move on to Jim. There are two questions. First, uh, first is what is Microsoft's definition of sustainability? Um, it's uh, pretty broad. I'll point you to uh, a link. So I'm part of the AI for Earth program. Uh, so that's going to lay out like, you know, the main goals that we're, we're looking at. Um, and then, yeah, so there'll be a few links from there to the various um, programs that we have going on for sustainability. And I pasted another two questions in the chat box. Let me pull it up here. All right. Uh, comparisons between Stack and OGC EDR, um, are they compatible? I do not know. I'm not familiar with uh, OGC EDR. Although there was a, it did come up in uh, Amy's workshop earlier today. Um, I forget the exact name. It was like, uh, here we go again or something was the name of the, the session. Uh, hopefully you can find it from that. And that goes into detail and both Stack and EDR came up. Uh, I, can, and then, I can answer that yeah. one. Right. Uh, Alexander from Azure Group. No, stack in ADR or GC in DR is not are not compatible. Different use cases. Okay. EDR Great, is thanks. really environmental, you know, all kinds of environmental data. Stack is really towards the you know imagery of land. Essentially. Thanks. Um, yeah, the saga continues was the, the name of the session. Uh, and then the next question was, can Stack be tailored to individual use? Uh, yes, definitely. And so we'll, we'll see an example of that. We'll actually have a couple of Stack uh, catalogs that we're working with. One for the labels, which I, I would say is tailored to this uh, individual use. And then it's just like a, a, a bunch of JSON documents on blob storage or a file system. And then there's the, the planetary computers Stack API, which is like a big, uh, you know, big deployment thing. I think there's one last question if you want to answer it, but um, it should be a quick answer. Let's see, which one is that? How does that handle non-historical uh, time? Yeah. Uh, uh, non-historical time, yeah. Um, I am not entirely sure. So stack items do, uh, they strongly recommend having a date time associated with them. Uh, but there, it's not required. So uh, you could definitely stick a something like a forecast that um, uh, doesn't have like a finite date time associated with it, like a specific date time. Um, or it also allows for uh, date ranges, I believe, at least in some parts. So you can have a, a range there if you need. I would leave the rest of the questions to be answered by Tom on the chat, um, but we'll move on now to Jim. Um, so Jim, please uh, go ahead and present. Thank you so much. All right, thank you. Um, sorry, this can't be full screen. Uh, when I make it full screen, everything else dies. Uh, I just found out with this software. Um, and uh, I also apologize, this has a bit more um, 
this as content that you probably want to unpack later and, and think about and see how it affects your own work. And so to do that, you want to have a copy of these slides, either they're in the material somewhere or you go to this URL. Um, but the idea is that uh, whenever you're working on anything ambitious and certainly anything to do with big data is ambitious, uh, if you've run something and you've gotten something so far and you see it on your own screen right in front of you, what would it mean for that to be reproducible? Now, people mean all sorts of different things, and so I'm going to actually put numbers on them, and so you know what you mean, and you intentionally decide what it means to capture what you did and be able to share it or to replay it. Uh, the link is in the chat now. Thank you. And so a prototypical example is you have a Jupyter notebook, and you ran some, some things, you executed some cells, and you got a number, or you got a table, or you got a figure. For that to, to mean something, as a reproducible result, you have to be able to um, run to know what you did. So uh, we'll talk about nine levels of code reproducibility and we'll skip through most of them. But first off, this is code reproducibility. I'm not focusing on data reproducibility. So I assume that if you have big data, which I usually do, you take a tiny little subset, small enough you can stick it in a zip file and use that to reproduce. And you show that, oh, I can reproduce that and then also reproduce it with this big data set that's too big for me to have. So first assumption is you assume the data is reproducible. I'm also assuming you're only going to use open source tools so you can freely you have no licensing restriction. You can just freely capture everything and pass it around. Uh, it's highly recommended you do that anyway, because otherwise it's only reproducible by people who have the proprietary tool. But uh, anyway, we're assuming OSS and we're assuming Python and we're assuming Conda. Now everything I say in this can be adapted to any other scenario. So just imagine I'm doing it in Python. You can do it however you want. And then I have uh, nine levels. Each level subsumes the previous level. So basically, you, it's level unlocked and achieved. So level zero is you got a result and you see it on your screen. Who is that reproducible by? It's by some superhuman version of you, not really you. Because to reproduce it, it would be requiring you to remember the order you executed the cells in the notebook. Remember any little thing you fixed as you were going along and you have access to the same machine, exactly the same, and nothing has changed. You got all the data, everything there. That's, that's what's called not reproducible. Um, but that's typical. Uh, this is where everybody starts. So level one, you can run it if you hit restart and run all in Jupyter, which means it replays the series of cells in the same order with no human being involved, hands off, can you get the same result? That's reproducible, but only by you today, because you tomorrow can't do it, because tomorrow your computer's going to have different software installed on it. So that's not very reproducible yet either. Come on, we can do better. Level two, you capture the environment you ran the code in. Who's that reproducible by? You and your friends. You can pass it to somebody and they can run it today. Only today, but they can run it today and they can get the same result you have if they've as long as um, and it's, you get the result today, but tomorrow somebody might update a package and it'll break everything. So it's only today, but today you can share it with a friend. That's level two. And that depends on having a conda environment that captures the, uh, the code that you need. Level three, we're starting to get somewhere. We can get somewhere useful. Level three uh, uses a separate command called anaconda project. And that captures not just the environment, but also the code. Because level two, you had to tell them, what do you run in the environment? Like Jupyter and then this notebook? Level three is a capturing of a, of a command plus environment. That's a reproducible unit. Because you can just hand that to anybody and they don't even have to know what you did. They just say, run that thing. They just said, Anaconda Project, run. They don't have to know what it is. They just know it is a runnable thing and it'll have a reproducible result. And that'll work by, for anyone today as long as nobody's updated a project, which happens every day. So you want to go further? Here's your minimum level of reproducibility, I think. You've done everything in the previous ones, but you've done what's called locking. And that finds every package you're depending on and pins it to that exact version. So then when you hand it to somebody, it reproduces not just the general sort of version, some version of things, but exactly the version you have. And uh, that one will continue to work. So if you, you reach level four, that's what I call, quote, reproducible at all. And that one, you can hand it to somebody and it'll keep working as long as no package has been pulled from the internet. So if you depend on Pandas 1.2, uh, 
and that package was pulled later for a security problem or some build problem, you would know it still wouldn't work. It's rare, but it does happen. So you probably, you might want to consider going further. Level five, everything you did before, but it, packs, it captures the current state of all the packages and crams it into a big zip file. Now that, oh, that's pretty irresistible by anyone ever. Even if Conda disappears, Anaconda goes out of business, everything gets locked up and no one has anything. As long as you can get the basic command somewhere on the internet for Conda and Conda project, and you're not depending on what's in your system libraries, that's reproducible. Now it's a big file, but it's reproducible. You might go further. Uh, whoops, I missed, uh, shoot, I missed level six somehow. Um, Anyway, level seven is the uh, level, let's just call this, yeah, there's no level six. There's level seven though. Um, level seven is the same thing before, but you captured in Docker. Now Docker captures Anaconda project and everything in it, and then you can just pass that to anyone who can run Docker. And then, um, yeah, I, I completely messed up this slide, sorry. Uh, anyway, I'll just tell it in words. Level six is you captured in Docker. And you can hand it to anyone who can run Docker. And then level eight is you capture that Docker in a virtual machine. Now a virtual machine is like Docker, but it includes all the system libraries, everything that you need for the whole system. It's got a, like a fake audio device and a fake everything on there. Now that can help, that can, um, uh, sorry, that was actually a little, I'm sorry, I'm very confusing because I, I messed up this update. But anyway, uh, you get the idea, hopefully, that you capture, you, first you get a Docker, then you get um, a virtual machine. And then the final one is you put your virtual machine on a piece of physical hardware and you keep it locked in a room and you keep that in a secure environment. Now this, you might think this is crazy. We deal with clients who do this. We deal with financial clients, regulatory clients, government clients. They have a, a designated machine in a special room that nobody has the key to. If it ever comes up, they, they can go find it on that machine and try to reproduce it. You probably don't need that. All right, your final result. The take home message is make sure your results are not just in your head. It doesn't matter if you saw it on your screen. For anyone to believe you, you should be providing a reproducible artifact. How reproducible? How paranoid are you? What are you planning against? What are you worried about? But everybody ought to go to level four for anything you care about, please. And if you want examples, see examples.5biz.org plus our tutorial. That's it. Thank you oh, very there. much, Jim. <laughs> yeah, I'm I think level six back where it goes. No, that was good. I got it completely as somebody who's not technically proficient at all. <laughs> there it is. Let me check. There you go. <laughs> uh, I see what happened. I actually must have just clicked randomly on a page and dragged level six around. So I got it. So any questions? Oh, I see uh, there's one. Uh, Jensen will talk about GeoWaver and it looks like he's hitting somewhere between level five and seven. And that's a very good level to hit. That's that's. I, gr I love to see people hit level five. Level four is a minimum. I love see, to see level five and above. We got another question. Mm -hmm. There was discussion about the badging earlier in this week. Mm -hmm. Does Conda award the badging or some other uh, way to generate the trust in your project's level of reproducing? Uh, no, that's a good question. Conda does not. And I don't speak for Conda, by the way. I, I work at Anaconda, but I'm not on the Conda team. I'm just a scientist. And I developed these things mostly before joining Anaconda many years ago. But I've adapted them and improved them with best practice from my colleagues at Anaconda. So I couldn't make an edict that there is such a badge, but it's certainly, I, I think I could talk to the Conda team to suggest that so that people can say, communicate with each other, how reproducible they are. That's a great idea. And another one, what is Anaconda's commitment to saving all versions of packages for all time, not retiring old code? That's a good question. Again, I can't speak for the uh, Conda team, but we certainly don't delete packages lightly. The only, uh, what we've done, if we found a serious, serious problem, like a major security bug or major serious problem, we move it from where it normally is to a separate channel called deleted, I think it is, or historical or something, so that it is always accessible, but you not, might, might not be able to find it. 
So, so far, I'm not aware of us have, ever having deleted anything. And I don't know, I can't promise what can happen in 30 years, which is why I recommend level five. Jim, can you repeat level five again, just for the purposes? Level five of captures not just the name of the project, but the actual contents of each library. So uh, level four says, I need Pandas 1.2. Level five includes Pandas 1.2 already in included in the archive. So it doesn't matter if Anaconda were to delete Pandas 1.2, it's never going to. But if, if it did, uh, even for such a popular package, it doesn't matter, you've got it in the archive. Yeah, somebody is mentioning that's like static linking for a um, for a C program. It, it is like that. Um, level four is dynamic linking, where you know exactly what you're linking to by name. Level five is static linking. You've got it extended right there. And by the way, I made up these level numbers. Oh, they were really good. <laughs> a good framework to refer to. Um, so thanks a lot, Jim. Um, if no one else has any other questions, um, we'll move on to Ryan. Um, again, a reminder, you can have access to Jim's specially made levers on um, the slides they have uploaded on the schedule. So, yeah. We have another one. Do you want to answer this one? Or I typed in in the chat box. You can answer it through the chat box if you prefer. Hmm. No, there's no check, or no automatic check. All right. Ryan, do you want to go ahead? Sure. Can you hear me and see my slides okay, Cindy? Yeah, they're wonderful. Okay, great. Thanks so much. Um, so I'm excited to be a part of this session. Thank you to the organizers for inviting me to speak. Uh, what I'm going to do is, and I actually rewrote this this talk after uh, the plenary session for Peter Fox last night, where um, there was the, the comment about frameworks over systems. And, and so what I chose to do was to organize this kind of survey that I'll, that I'll step through around a framework. Uh, and that framework is scientific discovery using AI in the cloud. And then letting that be a foundation for this community to build new systems around it. Uh, so the coverage in this talk will be necessarily thin and incomplete. Uh, it'll be really intended to provide meaningful entry points for further exploration and advancement. Uh, and to facilitate that exploration, I'm going to attempt to emerge some key trends and gaps. And I welcome your contribution to that later in this discussion. So the work of this talk will be kind of happening after the talk in interaction with each of you. Um, at the end of this, I've tried to make this a really useful resource that people can extend. So I have lists of pipelines, software, articles, and communities that I think are particularly useful for your exploration and understanding. They, they have been for mine, at least. And um, perhaps this could be a sort of living reviews for cloud-based AI for the sciences. Um, so a question for each of you to consider while you listen is, how, how might we stay connected working on evolving this kind of living review? Uh, and I'm really quite interested to hear your good ideas on this. So the first point that I want to make is, to think about the AI workflow for the Earth and space sciences particularly. So I'm going to bring the space sciences perspective to this being a space weather scientist and aerospace engineer uh, to this community who really thinks well about the Earth sciences as well. So adding that kind of another dimension to this. But one of the things that we typically do, or at least I see commonly done in our field is uh, they want to know what the AI workflow for a project is. And we, you know, we go to the, we go to Google, we type this in and we, we try and find what other people are doing for this. And I think that this can be misleading uh, and it can actually harm some of the things we want to do for the earth and space sciences, because what comes up from that are, are applications that are very useful for us, but they need to be tailored specifically to our context. For instance, the, the business and the commerce applications, those don't necessarily lend themselves to what we actually want to do. So one of the things we took on at uh, the NASA Goddard Space Flight Center, and this is uh, sort of tangentially in project with the NASA Digital Transformation Initiative, um, was to take a model-based engineering approach to this. Can we develop new workflows, new model-based workflows for scientific discovery? And I want to present kind of a working workflow that we have for this. And then I'm going to highlight a few areas where I think there are some nice tools developing for AI in the cloud. Um, and so I'll, hopefully you can think about where we need to add to this um, as we move forward. So we've been studying this model-based approach to AI workflows for scientific discovery. And again, this is ongoing but we've produced several templates for a more appropriate workflow for people to understand and gain a framework to get into this field. 
Uh, and so from this workflow, I'm gonna highlight a few examples where groups or solutions have emerged within the earth and space sciences specifically. Specifically, my hope is to engage kind of the collective intelligence of this community and this, this discussion to emerge the resources that fit into this work, workflow. Um, so really all the projects that I share across this will affect more than one area and, and don't really neatly fit into any single area. So just keep that in mind. So where we start in this diagram and kind of this workflow is, is before we get to a data science question, we have to first understand the science question, obviously. But then there's this step from translating from the science domain into the data science domain, which can derail a project completely if that's not given full attention. Um, so a couple of the areas in my field in the space sciences that I think are, particular, are, are addressing this are domain science focused cloud-based solutions. So there's a couple, there's the AMGEO project, which is a collaborative data science platform for the geoscience community or geospace science community. And they really bring together a diverse set of heterogeneous observations um, from a number of NSF funded facility programs and individual community users to produce high latitude, global high latitude maps of what's going on in the space environment. So how the the sun and the solar energy is coupling down into the Earth's atmosphere and then eventually affecting the terrestrial weather as well. Um, so the platform is the AMGEO open so source software platform and it's a web application as well. And I've put, posted the link there if you wanna explore further. The other one that I wanna highlight is the Integrated Geoscience Observatory or the NGO project. Uh, this tackles the problem of, of really seamlessly integrating between geoscientists and the different data sets they use uh, to bring together into a software tool that's fully managed in the cloud and, and can be launched uh, by an, an individual laptop. Um, so both of those, I think, are nice success stories of bringing the domain to ask the science question and then translating that into a data science application. The next step is one that, that's been belabored this week, and I think there's been some really excellent discussions around these, but that's acquiring, assessing, and then acquiring more data uh, that are typically part of this, this process. So this is, this, this is the 80% uh, data wrangling time spent uh, of a scientist's time uh, that is, as the number is always so, so cited. Um, one of the projects that I think is well represented already in this room is the Pangeo Forge, which is basically an effort within the Pangeo community to make cloud native approaches to data preparation for geosciences. So it's an, an extract transformation and loader ETL project to create data object storage in analysis ready cloud optimized format. So I'm not going to get into all the details or the discussion around the uh, what makes something analysis ready that's been uh, talked about even in the, the conversation this morning. Um, but I think Pangeo Forge is a good place to pay attention. Now getting into actually building the AI solutions for this, this is something I think our field, at least as a scientist go, can, can really advance our thinking and, and be a little more rigorous in this. I think we need to take the approach of the actual AI community where AI is an active field of research that it integrates neuroscience and cognitive science. And we start to take the approach that AI is, is something that uh, we need to optimize a little bit more. And so I think there are a few projects that are doing this well. One that emerged out of a program that I've been a part of called the NASA Frontier Development Lab. Um, so these are groups of individuals, data scientists combined with domain scientists for a number of earth and space science projects to emerge AI solutions for the greatest challenges confronting us. Uh, it's been extremely successful and exciting to be a part of. It's a partnership between NASA, universities, academia, and industry. And so the, the industry role is to provide cloud-based resources for all these projects to do their work. And it's a really intensive eight-week summer program, um, but we stand up these outstanding cloud-based solutions. And we wanted to uh, let those last a little bit longer than the program. And so SpaceML emerged, which is a way of making these projects last and be reproducible and move on beyond the summer programs. Um, so I, I encourage you to take a look at that. It's a really active program right now. Uh, I wanna highlight one other one that, that keeps coming up to me and that I've been, I think was just an outstanding resource and that's called Papers with Code. It's a free and open source, uh, open resource with machine learning papers, code and evaluation tables. I'll let you explore that on your own. It's, it's, a, it's a wealth of useful information and useful uh, tools for the cloud. So I want to move on to how we discover with this data, the, the next step in this framework, um, visualizing and communicating these. The, the group that I think Pangeo is now feeding into and that I've been really inspired by is 2i2c, which is an international interactive computing collaboration. You can see kind of how they outline what they focus on here. 
um, everything is, is, is done through providing these Jupiter hub instances for earth and space science researchers. Um, and it's something that I think is, is going to pick up steam and I'm really excited about 2i2c. So I'll, in the interest of time, I'll move on from that. Um, I'll mention one other one who I know we have Chris Linus online um, who's very familiar with this as probably a number of other people are, but it's an outstanding resource, the earth data um, that's provided by ESDIS at NASA. And so this is something that uh, has really enabled some pr uh, frontier discovery with the Earth and space science data holdings. Um, I would be interested to hear and talk about some use cases of, of Earth success stories for, uh, for this tool as well. Finally, coming to education. I think this is a, a critical step and it actually closes the loop to feed back into the front, front end of this cycle and make it a, make it a full circular um, framework where uh, we really have to increase cloud and open source literacy to close this loop. And I think the communities that are doing some, some of the best thinking about this are the data and software carpentry communities. Um, so these are excellent lab exercises to learn data and software in a number of different ways, whether it's reading clubs or reading groups, workshops, conversations, and, and actually making things as well. Um, so if you're interested to learn and start picking up some of these tools, there's, there's almost no better place to start than this. Um, I just want to mention that there are some resources that try to address this and do this very well. Um, I think the science data analytics platforms that emerged out of the NASA AIST program through some JPL funded research and led to things like the um, ocean platform that they developed uh, are particularly useful and nice examinations of how you can bring this full framework together. And I've cited and in, in, in linked to a paper there. Um, but just to conclude this talk, or rather to, to stop talking so that a more rich discussion can happen from this collective voice, I wanted to end with a few thoughts on the gaps and trends that I think this survey kind of emerged to me. Um, so first, in terms of gaps, I think there are a number of components that we, we don't pay close enough attention to in this discussion, and that's organizing the funding, especially for long-term sustainability, training the users, these literacies that we need to develop across the community, making that really kind of approachable. And then data privacy is something that uh, is, is a, hot, a, a very important issue as well. Um, I'll actually point to a trend that I think exists around data privacy, but uh, I spent a couple of years at JPL and I know from experience there that uh, when they opened up an ITAR certified cloud environment, um, Tom Soderstrom described it as, as an explosion of innovation that happened afterwards. Um, so the enabling aspect of, of making these different environments, different data privacy environments uh, can't be overstated. Um, I think, this has been addressed already in the talks today, but working efficiently and, and really confidently with complex data sets uh, are the name of the game for Earth and space sciences. Uh, sciences and, and that's that's really going to be where we need to see some improvement. And um, that's in, in, not in terms of not just in terms of data sets themselves, but also how we how we work with those data sets. So uh, there was a great session this morning about graph based data science. And I think these graphs really can hold some more of the information possible. So working with graphs in the cloud is, is a trend I see. Or, or potentially a gap as well. Um, a lot of projects that we've, that we've looked at through some of this work uh, get caught up in, and actually don't even advance to the compute phase. So there's a lot of additional, there's a lot of groundwork that goes in and they don't advance to kind of uh, getting to the cloud benefit from this. And so I think that's a, it's a, a gap as well. And then there's another gap that I wanna mention um, that may not have been as, as much talked about, but that's considering the environmental and social impact of the cloud technologies and platforms. So there's a fantastic new book out um, by Kate Crawford called The Atlas of AI. And really in it, she examines how global networks underpinning AI technology can damage the environment, can um, exacerbate inequalities and fuel some shifts towards some things that we don't want in society in terms of representation. Um, and so I would encourage people to take a look at that and, and kind of deepen your, your understanding of, of how these tools impact things that we don't necessarily see on the surface. Uh, there's another quote that I like from the recent paper uh, by, by Shell Gentleman and, and all and others called Science Storms in the Cloud, which I think everyone should read. Um, and I'll, I'll let you read through that and these slides will be available to you afterwards. But um, really it's, an, it's important to consider how these can exacerbate some things that we're, we're concerned about. Um, so with that, I think what I'm gonna do is leave up this gaps and trends slides during the question period. And I know I've gone a couple minutes over, so, so thank you, Cindy. Thank you so much, Ryan. I feel like you brought up such interesting um, prompts that might actually connect to my presentation later, but I'll let you reply to a question that's being mentioned on the chat right now before we move on to Jensen. Okay, let me pull it up here. Yeah. So, yeah, a comment from Chris Linus about Earth Data Search having an available from AWS facet. Oh, that's good to know, Chris, thank you. 
um, and then some more work from Pangeo. The, Pangeo is a wealth of, I mean, one of the things that I identify as a trend here is just that uh, to use the cloud, we really need to create ecosystems of open science. And anytime I think about that, I, I look to Pangeo as kind of the gold star example for me of creating a community of open scientists and open science. Um, so thanks for mentioning Pangeo in, in the uh, chat. I see, I see a question. It seems like the workflow takes the team out of the picture. Interdisciplinary team is an integral part of successful AI ML or X mathematics. That's an excellent point. Um, and I, we didn't mean to, to hide that within this workflow. Um, the science question posing is something that we consider an interdisciplinary process, um, but perhaps you're right. There needs to be some more explicit uh, detailing of that interdisciplinary component, because I absolutely agree with you. I think in this diagram, the scientists and the data scientists are ever present. So it's, it doesn't uh, mean one person can do part of it and hand it off to the other person, really need that intelligence across the, the whole life cycle. Great. Um, do we have more questions for Ryan? If not, we could also circle back to some of the important points that you have brought up. Thanks so much for um, identifying the gaps and trends. I think that's really good. And, and I'll just mention when you do go look for the, the slides, um, there's a lot of resources that I've just tried to put together uh, if you want to follow up and look a little more. So you, you, can, you can find those in the slides. Wonderful. Yeah, right. And I think there were some um, audience members that asked me if they could have access to your slides. So it'd be great to have a link to it or I can upload it as well. Um, okay, with that, we will start now with Jensen's. Um, thank you, Cindy. Hi. Um, my talk is going to be about the uh, ECIP GeoWeaver, the system uh, we are developing for the community of the AI, uh, especially for the Earth AI community, which uh, want to manage their complicated workflows. And also, we will overview the activities within the machine learning cluster in the past half a year. Um, the first, let's take a look at the GeoWeaver. Um, which is uh, a UCIP lab project, which is funded by Mass Access and NSF uh, Geoinformatics project. So uh, first, first is uh, about the motivation. So why do we uh, develop the GeoWeaver as uh, there are already thousands of workflow management systems out there? Um, well, the, the, the plan is reason is we, you know, after, after we talked with a lot of, uh, you know, uh, best scientists, the geoscientists, and the students. And uh, uh, we want to teach them how to use the AI, and how to use AI to process the geospatial data. The most uh, biggest challenge is uh, they are not very comfortable about the programming. And uh, the coding is uh, the highest barrier of the entry to the AI technology um, to apply in the earth science. So, uh, the the AI code that the the, uh, the most demanded feature is they want a GUI, it's like an interface that you can to drag and drop and uh, operate all those AI algorithms. They don't have to care about too much about the programming, like uh, transforming all this data, pulling the data from the cloud, and uh, turning them into an AI ready format. Something like that. They want to use some software that is not available. So. First step, I think we should give them a GUI to do that. So if they can see a VRO interface, that will be much easier for them to, to keep going with the AI research, to, to include more people to work on AI. And uh, I think that's very important. So right now, uh, we do not have that kind of the system. So we decided to develop a GeoWeaver uh, to fill in that gap. So uh, the current system interface is not like, not like this, but uh, it's still under intensive development. So uh, if you have any requirements about this interface, uh, if, if you want to use this software, just send us an email or post a GitHub issue uh, on the, because this project is open source, you can always post an issue there and then we can change 
according to your requirement. So what exactly is a job weaver? So it's a, it's basically a workflow management software, but it's a little bit different from the others. It's running in the browser and it can glue the code and distribute the computer together. So uh, we don't we don't we don't have to worry about uh, where your instance is it like error or Google as uh, Google Cloud or the um, IBM Cloud. So you can you can con combine all those computing resources into one workflow using Geoweaver. So we can provide all these host sections to manage all those systems you have, even though those uh, systems are gone in the future because of uh, the cost or. You don't want to maintain that pay like a hundred dollars every month. Uh, even those those uh, systems are gone, you can still access your code because that is on somewhere else. You have access, you have control, like your laptop. So you don't have to worry about the dependency on specific computing resources. You just uh, glue them dynamically and run your experiment. That will uh, help you to keep uh, flexibility. And also we will provide the functions to keep track of all those uh, workflow execution uh, on the fly. So uh, every execution will be recorded, fully recorded, as I mentioned uh, to the gym. So we're trying to make the Joeweaver workflow to be like level four to level seven of uh, reproducibility as the gym mentioned. And uh, this is the original, uh, ECF app incubator project, and it's a homegrown software available in the ECF GitHub. So you can check out that uh, and the fork and the contributor as you wish. So it's installable on Windows, Mac, and uh, Linux. So any system you have, uh, it should uh, work for you. And uh, right now it's still under intensive development. It's a prototype and expect, we expect it to reach the first stable version at the end of this year. Uh, and basically, it can support several features that is urgently required by people. I mean, AI practitioners like a code, code and the host separator on, on the fly is recording. Because this is very important. The AI model has a very high level of uncertainty. And every time you run the model, you always get something different. And even though uh, if, you train, if you train the model with like a several samples, different training data set, the results were totally different. So using uh, Geoweaver, it, it can help us to check, you know, to record all those histories and uh, prevent, you know, retraining or wasting time on, you know, comparing a slightly different between each ex execution. So because all those history is recorded, everybody else can examine it and uh, you, you just do not have to run the whole workflow on the cloud. You waste uh, more money on that. And uh, uh, there is some there is some uh, ongoing progress. Like the, we are creating a proxy for the Google S engine, and the, we are um, creating some building Keras processes. Keras is a deep learning library, and uh, widely used by the AI students and also engineers. And we will create uh, some building processes so that they do not have to program anymore. Just to use it at night, just use it like a, a ArcGIS toolbox, something like that. So. They just need to input the files and get the results. They don't have to program anymore. That will be uh, that will really help uh, inclusive education in AI domain. So the students without the computer science background will also be able to get on board with AI. And also, we are uh, creating some function to import our, our export the models in some standard format like a CM CWL. Or some um, like a provenance uh, standard format. And we are positioning uh, ourselves to the market because there are too many web workflow management software out there. Uh, so, what's unique about the GeoWeaver is uh, it's designed for the small and solo SAF practitioners to effortlessly compose whatever they have. And uh, it, can, it can help you to reduce the cloud cost um, and reduce the dependency on single cloud provider. And it, it can also accelerate the sharing of the AI research results. Uh, so next, I will talk about the uh, machine learning cluster activity in the past year. So uh, we invited the two, two talks, the one from the uh, Cassie from Dr. Cassie 
Kashness from the uh, Berkeley lab. And uh, he talked about how to integrate the physics in your AI into the physics model and to help improve the accuracy and like, uh, recognize the patterns, emulate the complex processes, unscale the data, accelerate the simulations and improve the forecasting. All of these amazing things can be done by the AI. It's, it's very promising. So uh, if you are interested in integrating the AI into the real uh, system sciences, you can try one of those. Um, there is a lot of opportunities there. And also we invited Tom uh, to give a talk on May 21st about uh, Stack and uh, Jupyter Hub. So later uh, he will give us a live demo as well. And we have uh, finished a paper uh, together with uh, the ESDS, the NASA ESDS working group um, on the reviewing the, the existing uh, research about Earth AI. And this paper has been finished. And you can see this, this figure is coming from that paper. And we uh, concluded that there are basically four stages. It's, this figure is similar to, uh, to what Ryan just showed us. But it has four stages. The first one is the pro problem uh, identification. You have to find out what is uh, uh, the right question in earth science that is able to be solved by the AI. And that is a critical step. You have to uh, think about combining the AI functionality and, and the what problem you have. Sometimes AI doesn't work. So it can only solve a, a group of questions there. So you have to find the right question for it. And the second step is the model development. So at, at this point, uh, we are still at an early stage. So the first few stage is uh, where most people are working on. And the, about the deployment, the production, and the integration of this here making, and the AI is still in an experiment stage. And another activity we have is that we created this awesome Earth AI repository. So to just uh, list all the recent uh, progress in the resources, learning resources, tutorials in one place. So people can just uh, get updates from there. And also we welcome everybody to contribute. And uh, if you have uh, some news and materials or you, you know somewhere that, that that probably is benefiting everybody. So you are uh, welcome to contribute to this report. Uh, as the next step of the machine learning uh, clusters activity, so uh, welcome everyone to join our monthly meetings. And uh, we will invite more ML um, practitioners to give us a talk about their uh, daily experiences. And the uh, next step is uh, we're gonna um, develop, like, continue to develop the GeoWeaver and uh, exercise the ideas to address the uh, geoinformatics challenge, in, including the AI. And also, uh, most of the community uh, efforts will be recorded and published. So we are planning to write another paper, probably wide papers about how the AI uh, should be integrated in the geoinformatics and uh, earth science and space science. That's all from me, Cindy. Great, thanks Jensen. I think uh, we'll run time for the last 10 minutes, but I think there was a question for you on Slido. Um, yes, and yeah. Tian has just mentioned it, yeah. And in comparison between Joe, Joe Wa Waver and MLflow. MLflow, um, well, I think MLflow is more like a, a managed, I mean, I'm not familiar with the ML flow, but I think uh, it's, a, it's more like a GeoWeaver can be installed uh, anywhere and ML flow is like a managed service hosted by some centralized provider. I'm not sure if I'm, uh, I'm right. Um, but that's could be my answer at this point. Thank you for the question. Maybe we can second back on that question during demonstration, Jensen. Um, yeah, yeah, I will, I will check out the ML flow. Yeah. Um, so if there are no other questions, I will present my presentation before we move on to our break and then the demonstration. Um, okay, let me just share my screen. Do you all see my screen correctly? Yes. Great. 
Awesome. Okay. So uh, thanks everyone for being here. Um, so unlike the rest of the speakers here who are all very technically proficient uh, and very well read in the, in the work that they do, um, I'm actually a social scientist. And today I'll talk to you about the social dimensions around implementing some of this um, AI and cloud solutions in urban environmental sciences. So my name is Cindy Lin. I'm the community fellow for the machine learning research cluster at ESIP. And I'm also a postdoctoral fellow at Cornell University. Over the last decade, we have witnessed a growing interest in AI and data science in the earth and environmental sciences. As covered by the various presenters that we have here today, we have found ways to integrate AI and data science into our workflows and just really scale up these processes. Yet the question still remains, how do we ensure the results of these data science outputs are fair, unbiased, and transparent, or adhere to what some may term as AI or data ethics? It's been broadly established that physical and computer science researchers place greater attention to the theoretical performance of AI models and less on how users actually use these AI models themselves. Accordingly, a lot of what makes an AI model usable depends on its trustworthiness. What's considered trustworthy is driven by the needs of end user groups. The European Commission defines trustworthy AI according to three principles, lawful, respecting all applicable laws and regulations, ethical, respecting ethical principles and values, and third, robust, both from a technical perspective while taking into account its social environment. Nonetheless, such frameworks are developed in relation to the legal, political, and social norms of Euro-American countries. How do these principles map onto other regions, especially in countries where public trust in government data and technology have been met with much skepticism. In the following slides, I aim to show how ethical AI involves asking just one important question. Whose context matters when designing AI? At the heart of this question is the notion of power. Knowing what different end user needs are doesn't necessarily drive the ethical development of AI. Instead, knowing the context in which certain needs are being prioritized over others can inform the design of these technologies and their social implications. I show how focusing on political and socioeconomic context instead of the nominal needs of end users can bring into view the dynamics that determine whose needs become primary and in turn direct AI, ethical AI production. So as an information scientist trained in social sciences, and ethnographic research methods, I have interviewed and shadowed the work of people involved in the design and development of AI and data science. So between 2017 to 2020, I conducted three years of field work in Indonesia alongside government and industry computer engineers and environmental scientists, mostly in Jakarta, the capital city of Indonesia and South Sumatra, where some of these technologies are being deployed. During this time, I worked as a research intern in a government engineering agency called BPPT. Now, BPPT recently collaborated with IBM to develop peatland fire prediction system. Tropical peatland in Indonesia, as some of you might know, is the world's largest natural carbon storage. So when it dries out and burns, we are burning fossil fuels, releasing thousands of years of carbon. In the context of Indonesia, the fourth most populous country and one of the most biodiverse regions in the world, peatlands are where mostly poor smallholder farmers and the world's largest palm oil cultivation are located. For the last five decades, major palm oil businesses have expropriated land for migrant farmers and indigenous communities alike to build both canals and plantations throughout Sumatra and Kalimantan Islands in Indonesia. Now, these canals basically dry out very swampy peatland and makes it very susceptible to fires, especially during dry seasons. However, palm oil companies are, however, rarely held accountable. Furthermore, government research institutions in Indonesia have differing data standards and motivations for producing maps and knowledge about peatland fires, leading the Indonesian public to mistrust government data as fires have increased in frequency over the years. 
At the turn of the 21st century, the Indonesian government initiated greater efforts to integrate AI and data science techniques in the management of these fires. It promoted the use of AI and data science as efficient, accurate, and objective in the hopes of really instilling public trust in government's capacity to manage this large-scale environmental crisis. In 2019, the Indonesian President Joko Widodo delegated BPPT, my primary field site, the role of developing an artificial intelligence innovation center with IBM. Now, the president's vision of this partnership was to develop the first prototype of the peatland fire prediction system in just three months. Indonesia's peatland fire prediction system was aimed at predicting peatland fires using the groundwater level of peat. Research has shown that the lower the groundwater level of peat, which is decreased due to the draining of peatland with canals, the more susceptible it is to fire. Now, to measure the groundwater level of peat, Peatland water sensors have been installed across 142 plant sites in rural Sumatra and Kalimantan Islands. For now, they are designed to only take a single measurement of groundwater level every 10 minutes. While its initial design involved a more refined and dynamic data collection, such as the inclusion of rainfall data, as well as temperature, this has changed over the years since its first installation in 2016. The Indonesian administration, now eager to cut costs in peatland fire prevention, decided to make the census omit rainfall data in order to cut costs and scale up the technology across Indonesia. Hence, BPPT had to make do with existing data, most of which cannot fully account for the dynamics of peatland hydrology, as well as the effects of peatland clearing by palm oil corporations. To make things even more difficult for BPPT, ministries who had data access to current peatland groundwater sensors did not provide them access on accounts that such data is sensitive. They were sensitive because these ministries were afraid that BPPT might use this data to show how palm oil corporations had exploited and cleared peatland, making the issue of fire prevention political. When one of the IBM data scientists attacked to request data directly from the ministries, a senior engineer in BPPT warned him to never do that again. He reasoned that it might look like BPPT researchers are trying to defy the request of ministries who refuse to share that data and could be interpreted as an act of defiance to higher authorities. The information needs then of BPPT were unfulfilled because of the political context of peatland fires and data governance. BPPT of IBM persevered and took this opportunity as a means to show that they could continue the current administration's vision of low-cost fire prevention efforts. They used dummy data to make their fire prediction model work. Instead of collecting observational data of peatland groundwater level, which would cost too much time and too much money, collecting quality observational data was skipped in favor of producing a peatland fire prediction system cheaply and quickly. In sum, for my presentation, I want to draw attention to two main points. First, I want to talk about how end user needs are contextual. I want to draw attention to the difficulty in identifying these needs in the first place without understanding the context in which these needs are even influenced by and at some moments even silenced. If end users needs drive what makes AI trustworthy, we should consider the ideologies that AI and data science are now being associated with, such as cost cutting and efficiency. In other words, saying what one needs or what one has been told to not need is also shaped by the political and socioeconomic context in which data is produced, distributed, and shared. Consider the context in which BPVT want IBM to not reach out to other ministries. They want them in order to preserve the political order and social hierarchy in Indonesia's governance. Hence, a focus on the context in which the system is being developed allows us to see how AI itself is not just a technical vacuum, right? It depends on the social, economic, and political conditions. Here is where we might consider the role of social scientists like myself in bringing to light the context in which end user needs are articulated, contested, and even silenced. Second, I show how political and socioeconomic context matters not only in determining how AI is developed, but also whose context and why. As I've shown, it's the higher administration that ultimately determines whose context matter. That is, they, again, they need to regain the trust of Indonesian citizens again. 
This eventually informed the design of the prediction system itself, where cost cutting and the short time spent became prioritized over producing a more technically robust and data rich AI system. So even if da dummy data was being used, inauthentic data did not affect DPT's trust in the AI output. Rather, what evoked trust in AI is its association with cost-cutting efficiency, two very important factors as Indonesia tries to develop itself um, from the ramifications of the Asian financial crisis and more recently COVID-19. Hence, trustworthy AI does not equate to truthfulness or authenticity of data in all cases. I'll end my presentation with questions for audience members as well as presenters. As AI-driven technology scales up in earth and environmental sciences, we might begin to understand how we can enable ethics within organizations with these four questions around context. Four, first, whose goals and motivations are being achieved? Second, through what division of labor and under what social hierarchy? Third, under whose control? And fourth, at what expense? Okay, so thank you very much, everyone, for coming for this presentation. I know we have no time for any questions from me. Um, and so we will probably, I'll probably answer them on Slido. Um, I just want to make sure that everyone knows that they should stay, have a break for 15 minutes. Um, and then we can circle back to the demonstrations and I'll also some, answer some of the questions regarding my presentation. Um, so yeah. Thank you very much. So, Cindy, do you want everyone back here at quarter two or do you want to give them a true 15 and have them back at uh, 48? I would like to leave this question to my, 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 my folks who are doing the demonstrations. What do you all think? Do you want them to be back on time at 345 or a true 15 minute break? On time. <laughs> On time. I need all my time, so yeah. Tom needs all the time. So 3.45, I'm so sorry, everyone. Come back at 3.45. Or just stay here and just off and mute yourself. Thank you very much for listening to our talks. Um, please join the ESIP machine learning research cluster. We are a very multidisciplinary team, as you can see. We have social scientists. We also have computer engineers and our scientists. Um, the links are in the chat box. So do join our mailing list and do come for our cluster meetings. Thank you very much. I think people are trickling out. Thanks everyone. I, I, I live tweeted some of your presentations. I hope you all don't mind. It was just a short summary of stuff. Um, So does anyone taking notes? <laughs> I didn't take notes, but we have this session recorded. So okay. that's a good thing. Yeah. So it'll be uploaded if everyone agrees to have it uploaded. I think that you all should take a real break as well <laughs> before you give your demonstrations. <laughs> yeah. I will paste the Zoom chat note at your um, bottom of your Google Doc. Thank you, Tim. No problem. Are the, are the, the, uh, the demos are serial of one after another, or are they all going on in different breakout rooms? They are serial. <laughs> Cindy, that was a really uh, an interesting talk with a lot of food for thought. Thank you. Thank you. I, I don't know where you are, but thank you so much for that compliment. <laughs> uh, I'm in Colorado. Hi, hi, Ted. <laughs> now <laughs> I see your face. <laughs> yeah, we have a lot of questions. Actually, we had, when we were writing the paper on AI development with Jensen, Jensen and I had a lot of discussion around AI ethics. I think even Jim, um, 
brought in some questions as well. And it's surprising to see how many of the other sessions as well had questions around ethics around data collection, which I know has always been ongoing in ACID. So it's pretty cool. Yeah, well, you know, ethics around data collection and sort of the, the, the overlap with surveillance is sort of an interesting thing that, that I know a lot of uh, people are, are uh, concerned about. Yeah, definitely. I think that would be part of my postdoctoral project. And um, it's been interesting to see how the earth sciences community have navigated. I feel like they have been more open to it than the computer sciences per se. <laughs> But you know who knows. <laughs> so are um, you? Yeah. Are you done at the University of Michigan and you're now at Cornell? Yes, I, I just uh, defended actually that that dissertation was about how basically this fine line between surveillance and um, environmental monitoring. Um, but yeah, I've done that and I am moving on to my postdoc position in August. Yeah. Okay. Congratulations. Thank you so much. Thank you. Very lucky. <laughs> well, uh, judging from your presentation, I think there might have been a very small amount of luck involved. I think most of it was skill and insight. I hope so. Thank you very much. That's a high compliment. Yeah, I think I've been really lucky during the academic job market. But yeah, I had Jensen who was giving me the inner workings of like what's happening in the ML community. So. It's been interesting to see it manifest in, in the US, which is very different, say, in Indonesia. Well, Jensen is a great source, too, for uh, all things AI. <laughs> nice presentation, definitely. Jensen. Nice to see you. Thank you so much, Ted. It's actually the AI ethics is, uh, is a very hot topic in the computer science. Right? You know, they are talking about you know, you know, the AI ethics uh, actually depending on the training data set bias. <laughs> And if you collect the data uh, using a biased strategy, the results, the AI is going to be a bias. So, right. I assume you're familiar with um, the, the data feminism book too, which is also, um, you know, touches quite a bit on that, on that bias of collection and bias of algorithms and, and things like that. Yeah, I'm curious because like, I feel like that has circulated so much in the information science world, like in the social sciences world, but I'm actually surprised that of environmental scientists are also reading stuff that are circulating elsewhere, which makes me think that I have my own assumptions around, <laughs> around scientific, around the scientific world. Like I'm sure like, I think everyone is much more reflexive than I, I, I initially presume. And a Amy McGovern has been doing so much interesting work on AI ethics as well. So. Um, she's also conducting a summer school, I think, next week, uh, Jensen, where she's talking about trustworthy AI. So, yeah, it's been pretty interesting. Yeah, I, I heard some somebody from the IEEE community, and they are, they are setting up some AI ethics standard. Um, well, there are, there are a couple of lawyers out there. <laughs> And they say, okay, so the AI system, if they if they made a decision that caused some damage or um, perhaps uh, some serious, you know, people may die. So who should be responsible? Like uh, the AI entity is a system; it's not a, a natural human being, which is not an entity in the law. <laughs> so probably people who are providing or generating. I mean, AI engineers; they are just uh, you know the system out there, but the decisions are made by the system. So who should be responsible? That's an interesting question. Is it okay if I share my screen for the first people coming back uh, with instructions for setting up? Yeah, great. please do that. Right, we'll do that. That'd be great. Okay. We, I think we'll most likely have like 70 people it seems like okay. the other time will come back. Um, Great. Yeah, I think we have 40 GPUs. So, and then uh, the leftovers will have to be stuck on a CPU. So what about the, uh, so any username to work? Yeah, any username. Okay. Great. Any. 
I'm always excited to try, um, you know, the to build a book um, running in the error based on the free credit. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Uh, Tom, could you uh, did you drop those in the in the chat? Too? Yeah. So, there again. Keep pasting this message. <laughs> Good. Um, invalid username or password. I think that's the right password. ESIP summer 2021. Has anyone else had success with that? I'm trying. Okay. I would try retyping the password then because yeah, it works. Okay. It works. Yeah. Yeah. I did put a password on it. Um, I actually guess I didn't really need to. Um, oh, well. yeah. Any username will work though. And I'm curious, uh, yeah, so at some point people will see this warning. Uh, it should be like zero out of 40. I think we have 40 GPUs and yeah. Won't matter for the first notebook, but for the second one, it'll be like uh, 30 times slower or so, 15 or 30 times slower. So not the worst. And it takes a few minutes to spin up. Right. Yeah. I forgot to mention that. Um, <laughs> it should just be like, ideally like 10 or 15 seconds because the nodes are all there. For some reason, Azure has been having trouble with um, creating like the volume. So like the hard drive that this thing's connected to. So that could unfortunately take like 10 minutes um, sometimes it seems. Uh, and I have no idea what's going wrong, wrong there. There's an open GitHub issue where a bot, like every week, a bot pings AKS leads. This needs your attention. I've just been waiting for that to someone to look at it. I'm curious if anyone has actually gotten to this point. You should be automatically redirected to a notebook that looks kind of like this. It'll just have the top half. Yes. Okay. I'm on the CPU one. Looks good. Okay, cool. <clears throat> Mm -hmm. Even though I forced people to be back here at a quarter till, we'll probably give them a another minute or two, just in case. Sorry for people who are actually responsible. You get a GPU though, so there's something in it for you. That was a very lucky comment, Tom. <laughs> Someone had to decide, you know, and I'm, I'm okay being the mean person. Yeah, you should do that. Yes, you should come by. Uh, great. All righty. Um, I think I'm ready whenever. Are we going to do another round of introductions or are we just good to go? Wendy, I think uh, you should say start. Now we just go. That's good. Yeah, I mean, we had 65 people. We should go, I think, so that you have okay. more time. Yep. Great. Let's do it. All right. 30 minutes, right? That's what I'm hoping yes. for.
Cool. Yes. All right. Uh, yeah, so if you're just joining in, uh, check the message in the chat, in the Zoom chat, which has instructions for getting here to this hub. Um, hopefully, so if you're here on time, hopefully you get a GPU. Um, turns out the cloud is not infinite and they have quotas and stuff on you. Uh, so even though I work at Microsoft, even I have quotas, um, don't have enough GPUs in my quota, unfortunately. Uh, so only 40 or so GPUs. If you don't get a GPU, you can go to the CPU cluster. It'll be the same material, just a bit slower. Um, once you get logged into the hub, you can use any username for your username. Uh, and then the password is esip-summer-2021. Uh, once you get logged in, you can either click on this first notebook, uh, crop land cover explore. That's what we're gonna start out with. Um, or you can open it up in the uh, file pane here. All right, great. Um, so we're gonna be using, um, right. So the, the goal of the workshop is trying to get a feel for doing some geospatial machine learning. Um, the motivation, the, the problem we're gonna use here is, is uh, predicting some uh, field crop types uh, for some kind of you know, crop land cover data set. We're predicting types of crops from satellite imagery. Um, so the imagery is, is Sentinel-2, and then uh, Radiant Earth is actually running a competition right now on this data, where they labeled some, some chips with the different um, integer codes for, for different um, uh, crop types, so like wheat, barley, uh, weeds, and so on. Okay, so we're using this data from Radiant Earth for the labels. And then we're also going to be using data from Microsoft's uh, planetary computer, uh, Sentinel-2, level 2A. So this will be the actual imagery that we plug into the model. Great. Uh, to access the data, we're going to be using Stack, which I mentioned earlier on. So I'm not going to review it, but basic idea is we're going to have two Stack catalogs. Uh, we're going to have one static uh, catalog. It's just some JSON documents and blob storage that we'll use for the, uh, the labels. And then we'll have a second stack catalog. That's like the full stack API for Sentinel-2. Um, and that's what we'll use to search for matching items. So the overall workflow is we get a single chip uh, for the label data. So these are the uh, geotiff of the labels saying this pixel is wheat or whatever. And then we find a matching Sentinel scene that covers that labels chip. And then we align the two and then feed it through a model. All right. So let's go ahead and start working through these. Uh, if you're new to Jupyter uh, Notebooks, Jupyter Lab, shift enter will execute a cell. Uh, first thing we're gonna do is lay, load up that training catalog using PyStack. So this is a catalog. It's actually a collection, like catalog. Um, and it's got a whole bunch of links in it. So there's 200 uh, child item links. So each one of these items is an individual chip. We can look at one of those. So item 18 happens to be interesting. And so now we get to our first little exercise here. Uh, I'm going to have you explore this item a bit, get warmed up. Uh, first of all, find out what is the item's bounding box. So for each of these uh, exercises, there's a little code cell for you to work in. You'll do stuff like layable item, uh, maybe hit dot tab, see what's available. B box might be interesting for this one. And then you can execute that. And then you can, there's a solution cell. So you can uh, load the solution by executing the cell to get it, see what it is. And then you can actually execute it by running that cell again. Okay, I'll give you like 30 seconds or so for these uh, next couple exercises. Um, a chip, um, question in the chat, can you explain what a chip is? I don't really know. I've heard chips uh, described as like small little uh, box squares uh, from a larger image. Uh, so in this case, the labels uh, are 256 by 256 pixels, and people call them chips for some reason. I guess because they're chips of a larger um, image. I think it's sort of synonymous with tiles. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah, so warning up front, I'm uh, somewhat new to geospatial stuff. Uh, so <laughs> we're learning together. Thank you. So that's the resolution of the classification, essentially? Um, resolution of the classification. Uh, I'm not sure. So it's 10 meter resolution data. Um, it, may be, it may be that 256 by 256 is a homogeneous, fairly homogeneous region somewhere on land when there is yeah. just weed or whatever. And when I say weed, I mean 
plants with not the weed yeah. with you know you know what i'm talking <laughs> yeah. about yeah yeah that's a different kind of crop i guess yeah yes um, yes exactly so <laughs> All right, so let's go through these exercises. Sorry if you didn't have time. We are a bit tight um, on time. Uh, so anyway, we saw, um, and we'll, we'll plot these, visualize these chips in a bit, so it'll hopefully make a bit more sense. But um, right now we're just dealing with metadata, with the stack items. So this uh, thing has a bounding box. So these are in latitude, longitude coordinates, like left, bottom, right, top uh, in latitude, longitude. Um, each of them has a, a date time. So this was captured or yeah, captured at uh, December, you know, 2017 uh, was at August 1st, 2017. Um, they also have uh, assets. So I'll type this one out. Um, again, Stack's all about metadata. It's all about linking to other things. So there's documentation on, on what this competition's doing. Uh, and we'll be using this labels asset. And as you can see, it's a, a TIFF. Uh, it's actually a cloud optimized geo TIFF. Um, and that's what we'll be loading in here. So we'll use another library called Rio X-Ray. It's a really nice way to load a single uh, cloud optimized geotiffs into X-Ray data arrays. If you've not used X-Ray, it's kind of like uh, NumPy. Indeed, there is a NumPy array here, uh, but it also has things like dimension names. So Y and X, it also has coordinates. Uh, we'll be using the coordinates a bit, but anyway, like the top left pixel is at this coordinate. Uh, so this is in like whatever coordinate Sentinel uses. I don't actually know. It has a, apparently has a bit more meaning than like, uh, you know, zero, one, two positional labels indices. All right, next. Um, the, so this data set, uh, or sorry, this uh, stack item also has some information about what the actual labels are. So we can print those out. So these are the various classes. So the, uh, the labelers gave each pixel uh, an individual class. And so here's our 256 by 256 chip. And you can see the class names over here. So here, this is, you know, pasture or something. This is fallow. Dark blue is like no data, which I think is just not a field. It's used for some other purpose. Okay. All right. Um, great. So that's our, that's like our target. That's what we're trying to predict is those, uh, uh, let me scroll up. I don't think I mentioned this, those integer labels. So there's zero through, I think, nine. We're going to try and predict that using Sentinel imagery. Um, and so this is, um, this is a bit um, harder to get at, I guess, in theory. Um, well, yeah, uh, we, we make it as easy as possible, though, with the planetary computer stuff. Um, so we're going to hit this planetary computer stack endpoint. And the basic idea is to uh, find a, a scene, so like a big uh, snapshot from Sentinel that covers this item. Um, so I'll let you, I'll give you 30 seconds or so again, maybe a minute to work through this one. Uh, see if you can fill that one out. Um, I'll help you out with this collections, just since it's a little confusing. Uh, this will be Sentinel to L2A. See if you can fill in these next couple uh, prompts here with what we want to find the Sentinel scene that covers our label item. And just in case it's helpful, I'll print out the date time again. Date time. Okay, so take a minute to work on that. Uh, there's a question, how long will this instance be available? Um, this instance will go away very soon after this uh, talk after this workshop. If you go to planetarycomputer.microsoft.com uh, account request, you can request an account on the main, I guess, planetary computer hub where we have a, a longer lived one um, that you could um, request access for and then uh, uh, maybe put in there that you're from the ESIP talk and we can uh, hopefully expedite that. We're a bit behind on account requests right now though. I'm going to close this. Oh, that was a notification. The Pangeo meeting is upcoming. I'll, I'll miss that. OK. We'll start working through this. For the B box, uh, we'll pass in the, um, the bounding box from the label. Uh, sorry, label item. That's what we're calling it. 
Uh, daytime is, uh, you could do like fancy stuff to like add a time delta or whatever. I'm just going to be lazy and 08-01, uh, uh, or sorry, we'll, we'll search for the month before and the month after, 09-01. So give me all of the items that fall in, you know, meet this bounding box query and meet this uh, date time query. And then this uh, result, this uh, thing that we get back items is kind of like a list. And so if you call Len on, Len on it, we see that there's 42 items matching our query. Okay. So if you have, it, if you have any questions on that, paste them in the chat. This limit is, is uh, not super important. We don't actually need to specify it, but it says batches of 500, just in case you have a large search. Okay. Um, do make sure to actually um, load this cell and then run it. You need to have this items defined for our next uh, section. So you have to have this items defined. If you don't have it defined, this next uh, cell will blow up. So these items, uh, we'll look at uh, item zero. Um, let's do two dick. This might be a little large. Um, anyway, there's a bunch of stuff, a bunch of information here. One of them under this properties, there's this uh, EO cloud cover property, okay, which kind of indicates how cloudy that scene is. So we'll pick a not cloudy scene or the least cloudy scene by sorting them according to cloud cover and picking the first one. Um, another of those links in that big dictionary is this tile JSON uh, asset that's on the Sentinel item. Uh, so we can uh, pass that to leaflet and actually visualize the stuff. And you can see that the Sentinel scene is huge compared to the um, compared to the uh, bounding box of our field, which is in blue here. So that if you squint, you can kind of remember what our field looks like, and this is it. So we've got this giant Sentinel scene. And this uh, tiny um, little little uh, field or group of fields that we're predicting. The collections needs to be a list, so I'll paste it here. And just in case you ever uh, forget, if you do go to the um, HTML page, which is a bit easier to find. Uh, then the code, the collection is here. Question in the chat, is there a good way to inspect how the data are represented in stack? Um, I can see a couple interpretations of that. One is the, oh, I addressed it. Okay, perfect. <laughs> Maybe it was this, yeah, yeah, um, great. All right, so one uh, kind of thing, not, not a stack thing. So this is very specific to the planetary computer. So all of the metadata, so like the stack stuff, uh, you know, the, the HTML catalog, it's all public. You don't have to sign in. You don't have to provide a token to do that query, that search. Um, so all the metadata is public, but the actual cogs themselves that make up Sentinel um, are not public. Um, but we do allow anonymous access as long as you sign the item first. Uh, so there's a bunch of docs here on like what that is, why we do that. Um, end of the day, it's just one more API request um, to this endpoint. And we give you back a URL that you can actually download. And it's like every, it's just like another URL. So like all the tools like REST Area, GDAL, they all understand it. Um, we have this planetary computer package that will sign all of the links, all the assets in a, an item for you. So we'll go ahead and, and sign that item. So again, that's just a, a planetary computer thing. Um, another extension is the proj extension or projection. And if we check the projections of our two data sets, remember we have the chip of labels. That's in this EPSG code 3264, or sorry, 32634. And then we have Sentinels in 32734. Okay, so we got to do a bit of work. And then we also saw that like the, the Sentinel scene is huge compared to the uh, fields, the labels chip. So we got to crop it down. There's this nice library called Stack Stack that does all of that and more. Uh, we'll walk through this real quick, but basic idea is you pass the assets that you want. I should have left that page open, but Sentinel has a ton of assets, right? Um, for all the different wavelengths it captures. 
Uh, so we'll grab like the visible light ones, or not the visible, uh, we'll do visible and then these near infrared ones. So B2 through B, B9, I guess. We'll grab those um, and then we'll make sure to reproject it to the label CRS. And then we'll do the bounds, um, cropping, sorry, cropping down to the labels bounds here. Okay. So Stack Stack's a, a really nice library for, for doing that. Um, takes care of all the stuff about laying them out in time, space, um, and then depth with the various bands. Okay. Um, so again, uh, looking at the data, I noticed there's a bit of an issue here. So they're off by half a pixel. I think that's because one is labeling like the center of the pixel and the other one's labeling like the top left. Uh, I'm going to assume that's actually the problem. It'd probably be good to verify that, but let's assume that's the problem. And we'll just adjust the coordinates on the, the Sentinel data by subtracting, shifting it, uh, what is it, left and up uh, by five, five units or half a pixel. And now we're all good. Okay. Finally, finally, we're ready to do some machine learning halfway through our, our time together. Um, not too bad. Um, we're going to do a quick little uh, K-neighbors classifier using scikit-learn. The only thing we have to do before we get there is transform the data to be in features by, or sorry, in samples by in features. So we'll do that by stacking the data. So basically this input data, uh, I think we're calling it data two now, right? Is a NumPy array that's like 256 by 256. We'll stack all of those 256 on top of each other. So the top left pixel will be the first one then the next pixel will be right below it. Um, and then the features are the seven bands. So we're doing that with this stack. Okay, now we have uh, it in the right shape for, for scikit-learn. And we'll take like uh, two minutes. I'm actually, believe it or not, we're going so fast, but I am a couple minutes behind. So we'll give a minute or two for doing this next exercise of uh, train test split and then fitting the model and scoring the model. So go ahead and take uh, a minute. Uh, we'll say 90 seconds on that. Okay, there's a question in the chat. Um, anything important to say about the integration with OpenStreetMap and the visual? Uh, no, not for that. We're just using the, um, uh, I think that's like the default. IPy leaflet is like the, uses OpenStreetMap as the default uh, base map. So nothing special there. Um, the question, um, can stack stack handle non-standard calendars? Um, I believe so. Yeah, that should be just fine. Stack stack will handle it as long as, um, as long as, um, sorry, stack stack will handle it as long as X-ray can handle it. There might be something to check out with, um, with, um, stack itself. I do know that it wants its date times to be in like normal dates. I don't know, uh, whatever calendar that is. Um, so I think there's a bit of an open question about how you represent that. Like if you want, if you have like a, a date that's uh, an output of a model simulation that's like February 30th or something, like should you represent that as actually being, you know, March 2nd or can you have a non-standard date there? I think that's a bit of an open question. Okay. And so it looks like um, X-Array, yeah, right. X-Array has like a CF time uh, special index for these, these dates. So, um, yeah, so I, maybe that's a bit of an open question. Okay. Let's work through this because I want to get to GPUs. Um, so this will be train test split just to uh, see if we're overfitting model selection, uh, train test split, pass an X and Y, and you can put in a random state here if you want, just for reproducibility, uh, hat tip to Jim. Uh, I don't know what the level that is, um, but we'll, maybe we'll see. Uh, and then fitting the model. So we're just going to use the default parameters. We'll fit the model on the training data. We'll score the model on the training. Level one. Level one. Thank you. We got a ways to go. Uh, we'll score the data. Um, so 89% accuracy on the, uh, on the uh, test on training data set. And we'll score it on the test set. So we're overfitting. And plot the outputs here. So predict, reshape back to the input. And you can kind of, it's not, 
honestly, I was a bit impressed at how well this K Neighbors classifier did. Um, there's like a lot of notes here um, about stuff we could improve, uh, but not bad for you know a few minutes uh, work. Okay, we have 10 minutes left. Yeah, 10 minutes left. So we're gonna blow on towards the uh, next notebook. And again, if you have questions, uh, I'll try and address them in the chat as we go. Take a breather though. Next notebook is this segmentation model. You can either jump back to the index.ipynb and open it up by clicking on it or open it up in the sidebar here. All right, um, so if you're on one of the CPU machines, you'll get a, a nasty warning here at the start about not finding like a CUDA driver. And then I'm gonna uninstall some packages rudely from your environment. Uh, sorry about that. And then note later on, you'll notice it's quite a bit slower. Um, the first part of this notebook is very similar to what we just did. The only main difference is uh, one of the problems with our previous um, model is that it only saw a single scene, right? And if we look back at, you know, that giant Sentinel thing, uh, it's seen, you know, this tiny little bit of this whole, you know, area, which is not going to be a good representation. It's not going to be a generalized well to other scenes. So we're going to work with a, a, a bunch of scenes now. Right, so we'll do a bit of stuff in parallel. I'm not really going to talk about Dask. I'm just going to open up the dashboard so that we can look at it here. You can do this too. either click on this link or I'll do it here um, just so we can see it all in one room. Uh, sorry, all in one uh, browser window. So what I did was I copy pasted uh, this URL, this dashboard URL and pasted it here in the Dask lab extension. Okay. Great. Um, so now we're going to load up some stack items. Like I said, we're going to do a bunch of them. In this case, 100. Uh, previously, we only had the, the one. We're going to do 100. It's a OK trade off between uh, generalizability and time we have to spend waiting around, watching a progress bar. We're going to load up the first one. You can already see it looks quite different. A lot more um, no data here, a lot more empty, not empty space, but just non crops. And then let's just like we did before, let's grab the actual class names themselves, the labels. Okay, and uh, yeah, you can basically ignore this. This is just a quick plot of all the um, scenes that, or sorry, all the chips, the labels, fields that we're looking at. If you zoom in a tad, you'll see that these are actually boxes. Okay, just in the interest of time, um, I'm gonna go pretty quickly through this so we can get act to actually training stuff. Uh, but one thing to note is that all of these labels share the same date time, which makes things quite a bit easier for us. Uh, that basically means we can we don't have to worry about you know finding uh, sentinel items that have like the right date. We can just use the same trick we did earlier for finding dates around the start and end of this uh, around around this date. We do have to worry about the bounding boxes. So as we saw, you know they're scattered all over. So what we'll do is we'll, we'll take a big bounding box of all of these bounding boxes. Makes sense. So we'll find the box that covers all of those uh, with a little bit of NumPy stuff here, just taking the min and the max and getting the order right. This took, uh, I think this took me like three tries, I think, to get the mins and the maxes right. So that's what we're going to actually pass to set uh, to this uh, stack API. Otherwise, it's the same. We just have a, a bigger bounding box now, okay? And thanks to that bigger bounding box, previously we had like 40 some items, now we have uh, 245 Sentinel items, uh, which means we need to like find a good one. Um, one other thing, so before we just pick the not cloudy one, we actually do have to worry about picking one that actually covers the, the exact chip that we're interested in. Uh, so that's done here uh, in, in this part. This says, find me a, a, um, find me a sentinel scene where the intersection between the label, so the fields that we're predicting, uh, or sorry, well, yeah, this one, the intersection between the uh, sentinel scene and the label is pretty high. So in this case, great, greater than 0.9, okay, that ratio there. Again, I wish I could go into more detail here. 
I definitely bit off more than I could chew for this half hour. Sorry about that. Uh, but we're okay. Now we're gonna get a whole bunch of items. Um, and we'll do it in parallel. Or sorry, we'll we'll do um, do what we did before, where we load in the Sentinel item. So now we're downloading a bunch of data. Uh, this is small enough that it fits in memory, so we're not going to worry about, about like saving it to the file system or anything like that. We're just going to save it in memory here, and it'll be fine since we're not using too much data. Last little bit uh, that we need to do before we get to the deep learning is writing a little data loader. So if you've used Py PyTorch before, you might have done this before. I'm not sure. I'm, I'm new to PyTorch as well. Actually, I got help from a data scientist, Caleb Robinson at Microsoft, who is very helpful with uh, the data loader and this uh, UNet architecture. So this is a segmentation model. I gather that they're uh, pretty popular for this type of land cover task. They take like spatial stuff into account, some like the neighbors and stuff like that into account. And now we can do deep learning. Congratulations, you're a deep learner now. Uh, if you're on a CPU, you're probably still waiting. Sorry, it'll be like uh, 30 or so seconds that you'll be waiting here. But anyway, we have run our unit over one uh, over the data one time, over those 100 scenes. This next chunk of code plots it for the first uh, 10 items. So it plots the, uh, I think this is the blue band in grayscale. It plots the uh, actual hand-labeled values for that scene. And then it plots the model's predictions, which you can see the model is not doing well. Way worse than our, um, our K-neighbors classifier. It's trying to do a, a harder job. It's, it's trying to predict for more types of images. Okay, So if you let it run a while longer, um, you know, between like 40 and 80 epochs, it starts to look quite a bit better. Um, I haven't done any, you know, research into like, like if it's overfitting. I'm sure it's overfitting, which is commonly a problem with these deep learning models. Um, but anyway, we can let this run for a bit. This will take like 90 seconds or so, um, and then we can plot it again. And we'll see it does a, a pretty good job on these various types of data, um, you know, various images. I'll let that run for a bit. Um, I think we have like three or so more minutes, um, two or three more minutes. So if there are any questions. That's essentially it for, for the um, my section, for my talking section. Uh, you can keep on playing around with this stuff uh, for the next little while. Uh, do pay attention to, to Jim and the other talks, though. Um, yeah, any questions in these last couple of minutes, though? What, what would it take to um, reproduce this on another uh, Jupyter Hub? With uh, Kubernetes, you know, Kubernetes and blah blah blah. Maybe. Yeah. Um, so this, the materials are here, and I have all the deployment stuff here. In theory, let's see. This is Azure specific. So once you get the cluster set up, you know that's cloud provider um, specific, and then you can do make hub. And then at that point, I think it's generic enough that it would, um, you'd you'd have everything. Um, there's a bit in here though that's like. Um, what was I going to say? I can't remember. Uh, that's all right. That's, a, that's fine. Sorry. <laughs> now, there, there is, I just remember there's some stuff in here and it, like this annotation stuff. This is Azure specific uh, for the hub. Uh, so that's what gave me this URL ESIP 2021. So that would need to change as well. Yeah. But anyway, all the stuff yeah. is there. And if you run into issues, let me know. Yeah, that, that's very cool. Lots of details there that are super helpful. Great. So you can See, it's, it's doing better um, now that it's seen more data. It gets this big class wrong, but overall, not too bad. OK. I think I'm actually just out of time, so excellent. Well, thank you, everyone. I appreciate it. Um, oh, real quick, if you do have other stuff, I'll, I'll put it in the chat. But uh, this is where all of our stuff is at planetarycomputer.microsoft.com. Uh, pretty much so everything other than the hub is like publicly available. So we don't have any like API tokens for fetching data. So if you just want to access data, that's totally fine. You can do that without an account. If you want access to the hub, you can do that um, by the request access. Documentation's pretty nice, I think. Lots of topics here. So great. Thanks. Thanks, Tom. It was a really great demonstration.
Um, and does anybody have any more questions? So I'll just pop them on the chat. Um, and now we'll leave it to Jim. All right. We're not going to give anyone a break, huh? No, this is intense demo sessions. All right. <laughs> Okay, intense demos, take them away. Um, all right, so uh, the material I'm covering is, uh, well, it's number one, it's all open source, Python-based uh, stuff. It's all free and there's no licensing or anything like that. It's all documented at holobiz.org. And um, if you follow the installation steps um, here, uh, you should get a separate and isolated environment that is just the uh, versions that are used for this tutorial. So don't worry about it installing a bunch of stuff on your machine. It will, but it'll install it all in the directory where you are. And so you can just delete it later and never think about it again. Um, but it's, uh, it's an example of going through what I covered in my talk, which was, uh, so this is a level four reproducible object. <laughs> Um, what this is coaching you to do, to, if you follow these steps, you can reproduce um, our environment, the specific versions that we had when we ran it, uh, plus being able to uh, show which um, uh, commands are run. Anyway, if you, uh, so you, I'm assuming about half the people will actually have gone through these instructions or will go through them now, and the other half will just watch and both are totally fine. Um, this uh, website at holovis.org it covers a, a lot of material. Uh, I recently gave it at uh, the SciPy conference and the first um, four sections took four hours <laughs> to give. That was with time for exercises and so on. And then we didn't, uh, we didn't try to do the rest of them, which probably take another hour. So assume there's a bunch of material, but here we're gonna hit the main points and the things that are, you can immediately walk away and start using. And that's, that's the goal here. And if you do follow this up until this uh, fourth section, what you'll be able to do is make a, an app like this that you could share if you wanted to, that you could share with your colleagues or you can publish it on a web server or whatever. And what it does is show you, allow you to take some data, overlay it on maps, uh, link it together with other, um, other plots. Um, you can uh, select some uh, widgets and choose which exact bits of data to show. Um, you can, uh, everything is interactive. You can select little bits of things and then see how everything compares to each other and so on. So that's what we're leading up to is to be able to just take some data that you yourself have been working on probably originally in a Jupyter notebook and be able to make it graduate to something you could share to other people and to start with things that are probably originally static and make them gradually more interactive in order for you to get at whatever you're trying to get at. So that's the idea and we'll just dive into it. Again, if you, uh, if you follow along, uh, just uh, follow these steps, run the tutorials, and you'll end up uh, running Anaconda Project Run, which will get you to a running copy of Jupyter. And once you have Jupyter, you can see how, how this all works. This is basically a zip file that's been unpacked in your directory, and it's got this uh, YAML file. I'll make that a little bigger. Um, this is a text file, just a human readable text file. And what that does is say that we're going to use these packages in this special environment called Holobiz Tutorial. And so this will be separate from anything else installed on your system. And it'll install Python 3.8 and these other packages. And then uh, the, no the dashboard that you saw here, this, this file records the fact that in order to, do ex to run the dashboard, you type this on Unix. You type panel serve and the name of this notebook and then show and that launches the dashboard. So this satisfies level four because it encodes the command that's needed to reproduce this reproducible object this dashboard in this case. But that could have been a set of figures for a paper. In this case, it was a dashboard. Um, and it also specifies where data is going to come from. If it's small data, you just put it directly in the zip file. Here, it's going to download it separately. All right. so. Basically, we've got a Jupyter notebook session. We've got some uh, uh, notebooks to run, and I've already launched a couple of them. I'll skip over the setup and overview because you've already done that, presumably, and then um, cover in uh, move to um, notebook number two. So launch that if you're if you have it ready. I'm going to take a second to pull up the chat window better. So I can see if there are any questions, just a second. There we go. 
Okay, and I will, uh, I'll post these installation instructions on the chat for anyone who needs it. Okay, so I've started out with this notebook. Um, Holobus.org is a, is a umbrella project that covers lots of different packages we work on. In this particular set of tutorials, we're going to focus on two tools, one called HVPlot and one called Panel. And I'll first focus on HVPlot. So here we're just, this is just all about HVPlot. And uh, all we've done so far is to uh, read in a uh, data frame, which took 10 seconds. And we can see uh, this is a data frame of 2 million earthquake events, showing you where they are located in latitude and longitude, and some, it has some other metadata about it, or various other data recording um, attributes of that event. So 2 million earthquake-related events. Um, we'll also make a tiny version of it. So that was GF. This is called small df. And so if you're following along, just ex execute these cells. Uh, small df is 1% of the data when we show a tool that doesn't work with uh, larger data. But we'll show everything we show uh, is designed to work with the largest data sets. And at the moment, I'm running this on um, using pandas, but it can very easily be adapted to run with um, Dask. The only difference is that you use Dask data frame. Um, and then read the data in with that data frame. And then if, uh, if you want it to be fast, you do you add dot persist. Pretty much everything else is the same. So uh, the published, in fact, until two weeks ago, it was all using Dask and we decided, oh, we don't want to require everyone in the world to use Dask. So it uses pandas. Um, we changed that all two weeks ago. So if you have a pandas data frame, you can do something like this. So this is true for any pandas data frame. It's not true for a Dask data frame, but for a pandas data frame, you can do this which is if you want to plot something, you've got a couple of columns, latitude and longitude were columns. Uh, you can easily plot that using the pandas.plot uh, interface. That means you've got your pandas object and you call dot plot. And in this case, we say not just any old plot, but a scatter plot. There are, there are a variety of types. So, uh, so we get a nice plot of earthquake events. Um, you can actually see the Western coast of the United States and um, down here, uh, South America, Alaska, up here somewhere. Um, so, so far, so good. This is that. This did not require any Holovis tools to get that. There's no. Uh, that's just always available in Pandas. Um, if you install HVPlot though, then uh, and then you import HVPlot.Pandas, or in, if you're using Dask array, you'd use HVPlot.Dask. Um, what that does is, is install the HVPlot um, command, which just works just like the dot plot command. Um, but for one thing, it works on a Dask array and .plot does not. And a Dask array is like a collection of pandas arrays. Um, Tom, I don't think delved into it too much, but a Dask array uh, has a bunch of underlying pandas arrays that can, can each be processed independently and merged together. Dask doesn't do .plot, it doesn't handle .plot, but uh, if you install .hvplot, then you can use arbitrarily large Dask array, which is great. You also get um, nice interactive plotting. Uh, which means you can hover and see individual events and uh, select them and so on, pan and zoom, um, uh, if you want to see more detail and so on. So that's all just for free when you use plot. And um, I'll skip over some of the optional exercises. Remember, I'm just sort of hitting the, uh, the highlights here, given the time constraints. Uh, I'm trying to make sure it's concrete. Um, uh, but one thing that's important to make concrete is uh, how you get help. <laughs> Uh, that's super important to try. Uh, so uh, you'll see that for any of these plots, you'll have a lot of things you can uh, mess with. Um, it just goes on and on. There are a lot of things to mess with, including special sections that are specifically about geographic options. Um, I'm not originally a geoscientist, but we had a lot of we worked a lot with uh, Pangeo, a little bit with uh, USGS, and various other uh, and uh, NASA. Um, projects, uh, NASA Goddard. And uh, so throughout those, we've kind of become geoscientists uh, or honorary geoscientists, I suppose. So let's skip forward from there. Just basically, when you step through, you'll want to really linger on the details. But I'm trying to get to the things that are really uh, new, that are new and different that are brought by these tools, and so, which is why you might want to use these tools for your own work. And the first one is called um, Data Shader. This previous plot here, this is a plot that you could have made in just about any plotting library. It's a scatter plot with a little circle drawn for every scatter point. 
And uh, in the case, uh, this is handled by, this particular one is being rendered by a library called Bokeh. Bokeh works, runs in your browser. And so you have to transfer each data point into your browser and then the browser can do things like hovering over it. So that's so far so good. But if you have a large data set, um, HPplot supports something called rasterizing using a separate library called DataShader. So you don't really need to think about DataShader much, although if you go to datashader.org, you'll see lots of pretty pictures um, of the sort of things it can render, but you'll see a few here. And so if you turn on rasterize equals true, instead of drawing a little circle for each um, data point, what it does is count how many data points landed in each pixel. And that's that type of plot is independent of the size of your data. It doesn't matter if you have a billion points, which is about as much as you can handle on this laptop, or 50 billion points, it doesn't matter. The resulting uh, rendering is going to look the same, and it's going to be the, the best rendering you could have on a fixed resolution monitor. And so um, uh, maybe not, skip right ahead. This is the tiny data set. What if we use the full data set? You can kind of get an idea of what data shader is doing for you. Here, uh, we had previously, we saw what happens if you can sample a few data points and send them to the browser. Here is all the data. Now, some of the data points, if you hover over them, you'll see 240 earthquake events landed in that pixel. So you know that there's a lot going on in there. And so you might zoom into there and um, see what are those 240 data points. Okay, now I've zoomed in. So now there's more like uh, 10 or 12 in each pixel. And you can keep zooming in. You'll see all the data that's available all the way um, down to, until you get to individual data points. And now you have an individual data point. So every pixel either has nothing, which shows up as NAN here annoyingly, uh, or it's got one data point. Also, so Jim, makes, yes. when you're talking about pixels, you're talking about pixels uh, in the client, right? In the client browser on your monitor as you were looking at them, this bokeh okay. plot here, it's a bokeh plot and it queries the size of it and says, oh, it's a, it's a viewport, which is this little section I'm looking at, and finds out how many pixels in that viewport. And then on the server, it renders the data into a viewport of that size, and then it passes that down to the client, and the client displays it. Does that answer okay. your question? Yep, thanks. OK, so this is server-side rendering, client-side display of a rasterized item. And it's dynamically updating this raster as you um, zoom and pan which allows you to explore the largest data sets. So that was why, why I'm presenting it in this particular workshop. It's, it's really useful if you're exploring data sets that are arbitrarily large and they may be distributed, they, they can be on GPUs, all of those are supported well. Um, it, it'll work with uh, Tom's various um, cases they showed. Um, and so you're separating the rendering from the display and the rendering into a fixed size array happens on the server. It might be a supercomputer, it might be the cloud, somewhere big and uh, big iron somewhere, but then that crunches it down to a fixed size set of pixels. And then those pixels are what's actually passed down to your browser. So that's, that's, the, that's a big reason why you might want to use these tools because they not only work with Dask at all, but also they work with arbitrarily large data sets, um, typically in Dask. So um, let's see, we got, that, we got about halfway through with that. So, um, um, I'm torn about actually having you work through stuff or actually having uh, the, being able to show you stuff. And so I'm going to make a bet that most people are probably just watching and I'm going to show you more stuff. So uh, if we have time, we can come back to that. So I'll, I'll just show you a few things, give you an idea of things that are, uh, that are done well in, or uh, that are easy to do in H3 plot, which are less than the other wire. Otherwise, here's an example dot plot. You can get a histogram. You can get that without HPplot, although again, you couldn't get it for Dask. Um, so with HPplot, you can get it for Dask array. Um, and then uh, here's the equivalent one for HPplot. That's all easy. Um, so you just call dot histogram, uh, specify what uh, range you want. And then uh, you can do the same thing, but I'll just show as a demo. Um, that's dot hist. You can get a smooth version. Dot KDE um, doesn't take any of the same arguments. And again, you'd use the help as I showed you earlier um, on any of these calls to find out. Well, what if I wanted it not to be blue? What if I wanted a different spacing? You can explore that, and it takes a while to find what you want. But there's there's generally an option there. Um, 
sort of skip ahead to uh, show um, uh, a, a new concept. So here's a new concept for you, not handled by standard plots, which is uh, this by argument. And that allows you to turn anything into a uh, categorical overlaid plot. Um, in Bokeh, those, are, those get nice um, uh, dynamic legends. Uh, so you can turn on each, um, each one individually and see how they compare to each other. But uh, essentially what we're doing, the, the case above, this was a boring histogram case. This is a histogram by depth class. And we calculated depth class, shower and room unit deep, deep. We don't get into that. But just imagine you have some categories of historical variable. You can very easily create a, um, an overlay by that variable. And uh, you, can easily, you can also easily turn it from an overlay into um, uh, you add, like it says here, subplots. And you might want to make it a little smaller. Um, and uh, so this is saying you're still doing it by depth class, but instead of the default of overlaying all of the depth classes, now you, set, you put them into separate subplots. So these are also called facets or small multiples. Um, and then you get a separate plot for each of these categories. So that's pretty easy to kind of explore how one dimension affects another dimension. You see some plot, you can easily see that plot broken down by any categorical uh, that you might be looking at. And then uh, if you want the same as above, but you don't have, you've got not just three categories, let's say you've got 50 categories, then you want to use not, group, not by, but group by, and that'll give you a widget. So here are three, you could easily turn three by side by side or overlay, but what if there were 50? You'd want to select which one you wanted to see. And so group by gives you an easy way to explore data sets that are not just large in number of data points, but also a large in number of categories or even large in number of dimensions, uh, because you can easily just show uh, one at a time, whatever fits on your monitor. And then, um, uh, similarly, this is just the same thing, but now, um, uh, categorical by uh, two dimensions. So ignore that. I mean, basically stop there. Uh, there's lots more to HP plot. We covered like three out of the 650 or so plot types. I don't know, there are a lot of them. Um, and uh, take a breath. We've got all, about halfway through. Um, somebody asked a question that I will get to, but not show very well, uh, which is, um, can we run a particular function on a selected point inside a plot? And the answer is yes. That's exactly the right question to ask for these kind of tools because they are interactive all the way down. You can have interactivity so that if you clicked on here, you can change what is covered there. I mean, sorry, you can change what the hover shows. You can change what happens if you click on it, what happens if you select on it. Um, you can change all sorts of things about it. And we that's one of our research projects to make it easier for non-Python programmers to easily add drill down where you can select a point and then um, have that um, same point lead to another plot. Now there are, there are pretty easy ways to do it. Our website shows all about those right now, but we're trying to make it be dead easy because everybody needs to do that. So we'll get to that. Uh, we'll show a little example of that if we have time. Um, uh, oh, and here's just, uh, this is that same, um, plot that I was showing you earlier on a pandas data frame, this is the same thing on DAS data frame. It's the same syntax, generally works the same. Occasionally you find you need to do dot compute somewhere, but typically you don't. Typically it's aware it's a DAS data frame and just works with it. All right, uh, I'm not going to cover this section except to point out that it's easy to um, add, uh, take multiple plots and combine them together. And here's a prototypical example. This is uh, taking a plot that has a tile background layer and taking a bunch of uh, scatter plot of points that lay on top of it. And uh, HP plot supports this star operator. It's from a separate package called HoloViz, a uh, Hollow Views, sorry. Uh, it allows you to take anything and overlay with anything. In this case, tile overlay with some points. And you can just have a long string of something overlaid with something overlaid with something but it's used, it'll be used in some later examples, so I need it here. And then you can also, it, with HV plot, there's just a shortcut. You can add tiles to any plot. Now they're not very full featured, but just any sort of tiles, uh, there, are, there are seven or eight different ones that are available and you just pick it and 
So any plot, if you want to see it on a geographical background with this uh, web mercator projection, if that's all you need, then that's easy. If not, we have a separate package called GeoViews. GeoViews does all sorts of uh, coordinate system projections, transformation. Uh, worry about that if you want, but a bit of advice, only use that if you're in the Conda Forge environment, because that's where everything kind of makes sense for the geo dependencies involved. Um, so if you if you use geo dependencies in general, don't, no problem, just use GeoViews. It'll, it'll string together the libraries you know and love or tolerate, uh, like uh, Fiona, GDAO, uh, Traj, and so on. Okay, uh, and then the last little bit to show of combining is just um, taking an X-ray image. Here, oh, I skipped over that we imported uh, hbplot.xarray. Now we can show off our X-ray support. You already saw that in Tom's talk. X-ray data is, uh, is fully supported by um, hbplot. In fact, hbplot supports about 10 different libraries, X-ray, uh, QPy, uh, Q, um, uh, Q, QDF, um, network S, X, um, very streaming libraries. Anyway, HVPlot supports lots of the libraries, including X-Ray. And X-Ray, um, if you use X-Ray, uh, that's generally going to be plotting a raster plot or what, what comes out as an image already. And so if you do that, you end up uh, here. This is a dynamically re-rasterized raster. So if I zoom into this plot, um, it'll uh, dynamically update and it's dynamically updating um, up to the limit of that raster and then no more. So if I keep moving in at some point, it'll stop being uh, updating further, but it's, it's sort of resampling that raster. I don't know where, the, where it tops out, but somewhere in there. Uh, so this is a raster date based uh, count of um, population on the earth uh, and zero is shown as white. So you see that, uh, well, I guess uh, ocean is shown as white and uh, increasing values uh, are in this color bar. And uh, as always, you can hover over it because it's bokeh, and you either know that there's no data available at all, or you know the, uh, that the count is, uh, per pixel is very high in the most populated areas of the world. Oh, and this is a, this is useful. Um, this is a log scale. Um, this, this is worth knowing if, if you did just a pure linear scale here, often these plots don't come out well. But all these things support what's called a C-norm argument, where the color mapping is not just linear, where it's just the top end of the range will be dominated by the most populated spot on the Earth, which looks to be somewhere on in the Indian subcontinent here. Um, um, instead, you, you can use a log, uh, which works well, or we have uh, an adaptive equalization system, EQ HIS. If you do that, then you have your actually it's Parameter free. It has no. You, you, this will work any, with any distribution. It doesn't have any assumption about whether it's linear or log or anything. It's just going to map it um, properly to the screen. And so, uh, as you can see, it's a highly nonlinear mapping. Um, the difference between these two colors is uh, approximately two. The difference between these two is thirty-eight thousand, something like that. Um, but it's uh, dynamically allocated. So basically, this is a great uh, a call like this. If you just get any big data, just throw it at it. And you'll see you know, something will come out. And then you can figure out what it means. You can figure out why the spacing is how it is. But this is a really great way to take your big data. It won't crash. It won't crash your browser. It won't cause problems uh, if you always have raster equals true. And then you start out with this histogram equalization. All right. Uh, then skipping over here, uh, the last thing I want to show you in the last uh, five minutes or so um, is Okay, you've got some plotting. You, now you've combined some plots and overlaid some plots. You put them next to each other, which is actually a plus operator that I didn't show. Um, now, can you, um, what if you don't want that particular plot, but you wanted to have somebody have a widget and say, drag that widget and make any plot they wanted. Not just uh, by a group by, like I said before, but for anything they might ever want to do. So that's this last section, and that introduces a new library called Panel. Um, Panel, P A N E L. And a lot of the stuff you've seen both so far is HPPlot automatically inferring and guessing and doing some panel work for you. You can also do it entirely yourself. And uh, it doesn't take much work. It, it's nicely integrated with X ray and Pandas. So you can just put a widget wherever you see a parameter. 
It's as simple as that in, in normal cases. There are weird cases, but in normal cases, you can do, if you use panel and you get a widget, here's a widget. Look, I made a widget. It's a floating point slider with this name, starts at zero, goes to nine, and by default is six. So that's a widget that doesn't do anything. But in Python, I can grab the value of that widget. The current value is 3.6. I can also set the value of that widget. I just changed it to seven. So you can, this is a widget that's tightly integrated with Python. Um, and then, uh, so once you've got that, that's, you're pretty much done. Uh, because the HPplot has this cool thing. Uh, actually, I have to reload the data. I have to load in the data here, but um, let's just go back to where we were before. As, uh, we, got, uh, we read a bunch of earthquake data. Um, once we have that, we'll be able to substitute our widget for just about anything uh, we want to do. So here, let's just say we took our data frame and we selected all the earthquakes with magnitude five of greater than five, and we get this data frame. Let's say we wanted to make that five into a widget. All you have to do is put the widget there. Uh, mag slider was my widget. There's a widget. Mag slider. Now, if I um, if I just make the same expression and substitute the slider, then uh, whenever I drag it, it'll filter the database by magnitude of 1.2 or magnitude of 6.8 or whatever it is. So what this lets you do is take any expression that you had, um, and as long as you can easily find a, if, as long as there's something in there you might want to attach a widget to, like if, if, you, if you have an integer, you attach, um, or this is a floating point number. If you have a floating point number, you attach a floating point widget, integer, an integer widget, a string, you might attach a selector widget. Whatever it is, if you've got some expression that has some output, whether that output's a number or a um, table, as in this case, um, uh, here's here's output that's a tuple. Um, here's output that's a um, matplotlib dot plot plot. If you have that, you just whatever your expression was that when it took a number, you replace it with a slider, and now you have got an inter interactive app. And of course, it wouldn't be telling you if it didn't work for HP plot. And so if you have it interactive HP plot, uh, you can uh, work with that. And then uh, skip ahead to the very end uh, is uh, you can do that for more than one with no problem. And then uh, then you end up with an app. Uh, by the time you put things together, you've got some sliders and you've got some outputs. And at the end of the notebook, you'll have some sliders, some outputs. And then you'll call the magic method uh, that we saw back in the tutorial, which was here, uh, which was panel serve. Oh, uh, there it is. Panel serve, and then the name of your notebook. And then it launched that dashboard, and then you're done. So that's a very abbreviated version of, uh, of a six hour tutorial. But the idea hopefully is clear. HPplot gives you nice interactive plots that are independent of your data set size and can be processed server side. And then hpplot.interactive lets you use widgets wherever you want, even just in a notebook if you just need a widget to try it out without typing 100 times or eventually leading up to a shareable dashboard. Done. Great, Jim. Do you have a few questions for you along the way? Okay. Um, David. Shume asked if you can relate this to using Shiny for R users, even yeah. though Python is a much more popular language in R. It is. Uh, so Shiny long predates um, any of this work. Shiny was a pioneering uh, tool for doing this sort of thing, but for R users, it was, it's a great way. If you're an R user, you should totally use Shiny to publish your apps. Uh, this uh, panel was developed later than than that, and uh, for a long time, Python was sort of jealous of R just to have Shiny. Um, the Python dashboarding tools, uh, tools, including Panel, there are others like Streamlit and um, uh, Dash. Th these tools uh, have generally surpassed Shiny, in my opinion, nowadays. But Shiny had had the first mover advantage; it's more well known. Uh, so you can definitely use uh, Panel like uh, or Streamlit. Both of them work well, like Shiny. Uh, Streamlit has a different approach. It's not Jupyter-based. Basically, if you're a Jupyter-based person, stick with Panel, is my opinion. If you're a script-based person, go over to, to Streamlit. They really assume you're on the script. We Nothing about the panel requires you to be in a notebook, but we make it so much nice, so, so nice, and works so well in a notebook. And then another question I see, uh, 
you can you can you use polar plots and uh, yes if you use geo views uh, geo, uh, all of views and HP plot by default support only um, this horrible web mercator projection that everyone in the world has decided on is okay um, but then if you need other projections go to geo views and that's integrated into HP plot so you can use it there great so with that We'll move on to Jensen and thank you so much, Jim, for the wonderful demo. Um, I actually downloaded it and it was pretty easy to run all the different exercises. Cool. Um, so, thank Jensen? you so much. Yeah. Um, so, we, we're going to demonstrate the GeoWeaver um, and uh, Amit. So Amir is our student, and uh, I think I think because uh, the, the hands-on experience is it's it's more like uh, teaching a student to uh, follow your steps. So I think it's better for a student to demo <laughs> instead of me because I'm a, I'm not developer and major developer, and uh, I'm familiar with all the features, but probably that's confused for a new user. So Amir, probably. Yeah, uh, yeah, and I completely agree with that. Uh, hey, everyone. My name is Ahmed. I'm uh, like J Professor Jensen mentioned. I'm a research assistant, working um, with Jensen to develop GeoWeaver. Um, I'm really excited to get the chance to demo, like just to demo the program, and um, I'd like I also appreciate everyone sticking around. I'm sure, everyone at this point has too much info in their head. Um, so just to kind of quickly go through this, um, I do have just a few things ready. Um, so uh, if anyone is interested in following along, you can go to the, this link, which I'll share, and you can uh, just pretty quickly download the jar file. And it's as simple as uh, copying the, uh, the command and going to where the actual jar is and just running this. In this current case, I already have an instance running, so I'll just leave this alone. Um, so if anyone isn't, isn't familiar with GeoWeaver, it's basically uh, an app that, or a web app that uh, helps um, like um, simplify any programmatic or AI or ML tasks uh, and to kind of present it in a more user-friendly way, uh, as well as managing the, resources around running um, code or executing distributed computing. It's a really intuitive uh, app to help kind of uh, with the aspect of uh, reusing any um, uh, components or sharing them or even modifying uh, or like uh, expanding on them. So the instance I have running right now is on my local host. Um, I already filled a few things in, but I'll show very briefly how to go through some of the stuff. I already have a local host and a remote host logged in, but it's as simple as adding the plus button and just uh, clicking one of the host type, adding a name and the IP of the port, so on and so forth. In this case, um, I already have one here. And the things you actually want to build the workflow around or execute on either your local host or on multiple, multiple remote hosts or virtual machines, you can build uh, any types of process uh, similarly to how you can add a, a host. In this case, I already have a few Python ones, um, but it's just a matter of actually putting the code or importing the file. So in this case, I have the example of going over um, some data from Sentinel-5 uh, to uh, classify and determine like emissions caused by power plants that we got their location and data from EPA eGrid. Um, so in this case, I kind of set up a simple workflow to just show how things would go. Um, so this workflow would include the process of getting the emissions data from uh, a repo or like a remote host in, in this case and just briefly explore the properties of the data, visualize some of the main features, and then just pass the, uh, the pre-processed pre data into uh, two of our models that we've built. So it's, it's pretty like building them is as, as easy as just adding a node and just connecting them um, in this case. So like that wouldn't be any 
like uh, like any way any more uh, complicated than, than that I guess it's uh, pretty straightforward so this would just run on my local host and I would just showcase some of those so this is some of the output that um, this would be from the third process and Throughout the, this running, you can actually check any of the, the, like the execution going along and just check its details. You can also do that individually for any of the processes by clicking one of, the, one of them and just going to the history and then going to details just to see the outputs, which uh, is showing right here. So going back to this, what we had, it's still going through the last two models. Some, yeah, so some graphs will pop up I think that's a good model loss. <laughs> and uh, I think lastly, the LSTM model would show, which I think has a great fit. Uh, hoping that we'll finish quicker. Yeah, the newly added process disappeared because you didn't click save button. Yeah, I think that's, uh, <laughs> that was kind of spontaneous on me. <laughs> uh, yeah, so this is kind of processing a lot of the data, so being an LSTM model. And here we go. So this is our last graph. Um, so this is just basically going through the real data and the train and the test. And I just executed all of them. And each one of those processes would have its own history for every execution. And every execution would have its details that would show its outputs. If I go to the LSTM model in this case, I can see its previous, um, see its previous, some small hiccups here. I think I'm having some, yeah, okay. And you can also, obviously, as you do more and more throughout the day, the actual graph would represent any of your running, done or failed um, experiments or ex executions. So this is just a very simple, straightforward way of setting up a host, setting up multiple code execution or multiple uh, things to do with the, uh, or processes, I guess, in this case, and then just setting them, them up in a very um, user-friendly workflow. There are much more to the app, things like um, connecting to Jupyter Hub and Lab to uh, basically proxy into them and have um, a history record of every uh, changes that you might do. This is a quick example of one of my, I guess in this case, I was doing Futurama here and just like messing around with some of the word clouds, but this would basically just go through any of the history and uh, I think some of them would, yeah, I think in this case, if we open, uh, sorry, this would be here. If we open any of the previous history, any of the actual um, notebooks that you might have um, connected to throughout uh, through GeoWeaver and modified on there, you can it would record the change. You can see the actual notebook, and you can download it or download that specific version, since it's like a versioning system as well, or just delete any of those history. Uh, there is also a plan to uh, integrate Google Earth. Um, they can add uh, processes for Bash or Shell scripts. Um, you can execute things for notebooks that can also be within those workflows to either train a model or get data. Or in, in, in my case, what I've done was just basically have like a pretty straightforward flow. Um, other than that, I don't know. Um, Professor, do you have any other idea, any other thoughts? Yeah, probably you need to show the dashboard. Yes, so yeah. And then I guess to get a high overview of um, what has been going through your user or your session or throughout all of your use case with the app, you can see all of the processes that were run, a number of hosts, any workflows, um, and then their actual statuses throughout time, and then any time cost for some of them that could just showcase outliers or any anomalies in any of your uh, like uh, execution or uh, workflows. And I guess, yeah, other than that, um, 
that's, that's I think that covers pretty much of it. Uh, I think there's a lot of potential to this. It can simplify a lot of um, going back and forth between multiple uh, systems or programs or hosts. Um, you can even go as deep as actually, uh, let's be here. You can even go as deep as um, going into your file system through the actual app uh, without needing to actually use any, any command line or some people who might have not been using that much. And you can just kind of go through your files, check if things have been downloaded or executed or used or renamed or any of that type of stuff. And then there, we also have a, like a shell uh, execution that you can do the same and like just interact with any of your command line tools as well. Um, yeah, I think professor, do you have anything yeah, to add? I, I want to ask that this function is not only for your local host, it, it could also apply to the remote host. So it's not like the Jupyter notebook, which only works for the no, local machine. So you can manage all their, like uh, the AWS instance or the Google Cloud or the IBM Cloud, Oracle Cloud at the same place. So you can log into them, retrieve their files and uh, have the command lines in the same place in Jupyter. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, even if you're cool enough, you can you can connect to your own servers in your house or something, I guess. So, uh, but yeah, I mean, um, I hope everyone actually uh, could use it, and we also we always appreciate any feedback. We are obviously hoping to ha uh, help any researchers or any students or academics with like utilizing this and simplifying any huge um, multi pro like multi part processes or. Uh, code that needs to kind of be put in one page to kind of have it be uh, more clear to to them and to anyone else willing to work or wanting to work on it. Uh, but yeah, I think I guess other than that, that should cover most of it. I really appreciate everyone listening in. Um, more than happy to answer any questions. Um, sure, uh, Professor also would be here. Thank you so much, Amit. Of course. Great. Cindy, I think that's, uh, that's our demo. Great, does anybody have any questions? We still have like two minutes. If not, we have, Ahmed has already um, published, uh, he has already posted a link to the GeoWeaver on the chat. So if anyone is interested in trying out, they should, and they can reach out to both Anna and Jensen. Um, otherwise, please uh, join our mailing list and um, you can find details of our Slack channel on the following link that I've just pasted on the chat. Um, I wanna thank the dear speakers who have stayed throughout for the last one, two and a half hours. I can't quite remember, um, but thanks so much for the demonstrators for, for putting in so much work to prepare all the tutorials and the demonstrations itself. I'm really thankful for that. Um, just make sure to join us for the mailing list so that we can follow up with you with more events coming up um, and reach out to any of the presenters if you have more questions. Um, so yes, thank you so much. Thank you. Mark. And thank you so much, everyone.